Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Bread of Life channel. Glad you're here with us tonight. I'm here with my good friend, Sal Cordova. Sal is a scientist and uh, um, he's going to share with you guys just some exciting things that he's researched that really put a, give a big problem for the typical origin story that we hear, abiogenesis, and then on from abiogenesis, the um, evolution of living organisms. So Sal's going to be sharing some of the problems. And I believe that some of these things that he's sharing, you've probably never heard before. So it's kind of getting into the weeds and, and it's, so it's kind of something people don't really talk about. So Sal, welcome. Welcome. And thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I, I feel very, very privileged to be here. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone that's listening to us tonight. I have exciting news. Uh, I got another peer-reviewed paper tentatively accepted in secular peer review. Uh, last year, there were two publications in scientific journals, secular scientific journals that were published. And one of them was a reference work uh, published by Springer Nature. It, and it's on university shelves now. It is the book, The Handbook of Mathematics and the Arts and Sciences. So uh, I feel it's a privilege to, to, to be here. I will try to share some things tonight. I'm also going to be, uh, this is also, I, how this thing came about, I was invited. <clears throat> Rebecca, I actually invited myself to Rebecca's channel and said, I need to rehearse one of my talks. I'm going to be actually presenting at the Creation Research Society. Uh, it's a young earth creationist outfit. We have many professors at Christian colleges coming together and researchers to talk about creationism. And I'll be giving a presentation there before all these, my peers. Uh, what a lot of people know, don't know is there are actually a lot of accredited colleges that have young earth creationists, professors of science. And I will be speaking at Liberty University, which is a young earth, at least up until recently, a young earth school. To be a professor of science there, you had to be a professing young earth creationist. The students who graduate there often go on to very fine institutions like Cornell and Johns Hopkins University. So uh, it, it's really amazing that they'll say you can't do science if you're a creationist. And yet um, people have shown that they can be creationists and then succeed at science. Also later that evening, after I present at about 3.15, July 23rd, 9 p.m. Eastern time, I'm going to be on modern day debate talking about the age of the earth. And I will be defending the young earth viewpoint. So this is kind of exciting. I'm having a chance to share tonight, to have unconventional views aired. And that's what I'll be talking about tonight. And we'll just see where it goes. I told Rebecca she's going to be the timekeeper because I could go on a monologue, and I have on my channel for four and a half hours. And I can just be very boring and long-winded, and she's going to keep me in check. And I told her, I said, Rebecca, when it's time for me to change the topic, just uh, just say, oh, Sal, you know, that's really interesting, but I'd like to talk about this. Can you talk about this? So that's what we're going to try to do tonight. I'm here at her service and then also – any of the interested viewers. So thank you. Yeah. And I just want to say for those who are not familiar with Sal, he didn't start out as a young earth creationist. He was a Christian and were, you were a theistic evolutionist. Well, I was, I was raised in a Catholic home and I don't know that I would now looking retrospect, I would say I actually became a Christian at age 15. So many of us, a lot of people can be raised in the church, but I think that's around age 15 was when I felt something happen in my heart. I had a vision at age 13, uh, and that still has haunted me. You know, what did I see? Uh, on, but then I'd be going to Catholic Mass and hearing, hearing the, the priest read from the Gospels and, and from the letters, the epistles and the New Testament, and I began to hear it for the first time and just crave it. And I think that's when I got, around that time is when I got saved. I, I was just, I felt like a, a new person. And so after becoming a Christian, I'd, I'd learned evolution in the high schools and I accepted it. And I also accepted a little literal reading of Genesis. And it's like, how does that work? It's like, well, you know, I didn't realize that there was maybe a conflict and I just sort of lived with the conflict and not, 
you know, try to reconcile it. And then uh, after I became a Christian for about one or two years, I was still a theistic evolutionist until I, I began to read a tract from the Institute of Creation Research that talked about the complexity of the cell. And at that point, I became a old earth creationist, which I was for most of my life. I ended up getting three science degrees during that time. And I, I rejected young earth creationism because of the distant starlight problem and radiometric dating. But then I went off to graduate school at Johns Hopkins University after I had a career as a junior scientist and then eventually a senior engineer uh, in the aerospace and defense industry. I, I went off and, and started going to graduate school in physics. As I studied that, I began to see, well, you know, this is some of the stuff in cosmology and uh, you know, radiation, it's not as airtight as we think. And I started to get excited because I was interested in alternative energy, uh, particularly low temperature fusion. And that had relevance to radiometric dating if there are alternate ways to change. And so somewhere around 2012, I said, you know, I'm maybe just as a step of faith, I, even if I don't have all the facts that I would want, I think I'm just going to accept it is true that the earth is young. And I went on to work with uh, Dr. John Sanford, uh, who, is a famous, who is a famous genetic engineer. He saved billions of lives, billions of lives through his uh, genetic inventions. His invention is in the Smithsonian National Museum of American History for his accomplishments. He's a retired Cornell research professor. And he had posited that humanity is young and I, I worked with him on that and other things over the last seven and a half years. And, and the more that I studied this, the more exciting it got to think maybe a literal interpretation of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, Luke chapter three, that's the right way to read the Bible. And it's the right way because that's, it's describing history and therefore the Bible is inspired. Uh, so, that's a little bit of my journey, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to have an opportunity to just tell uh, a different story than what you hear in the mainstream, because this could be really good news for a lot of people, that there is a God and that there is a Savior. Yeah, and so, and just to mention, uh, Dr. John Sanford, he also did not start out as a young earth creationist. He started out as a theistic evolutionist. So He started out as an atheist. Science. Okay. He started out but, as an but atheist. Then once he became a Christian, he was still a theistic evolutionist, right. but it was the scientific data that led him to eventually become a young earth creationist, right? It helped. It helped. Unlike yeah. myself, his was more theological. And I, I just want to try to set the okay. record straight. Okay. But he began to question evolution after he read Michael Behe's Darwin's Black Box, and he said, you know, this is pretty compelling. He said, I didn't even know that there was another viewpoint. And then he began to read young earth creationist literature. And he said, I, I think that he saw that there was the merit to that. But then I think what persuaded him was he, he felt that, you know, he signed up to believe in the Bible and he interpreted it a certain way. Not every Christian interprets it, interprets it the way that he does. But he felt if this is what the Bible says and this is the correct way to, to read it, then I have to accept it even if I don't have all the answers. And, and I really respected him for that. And then for like the last 22 years of his life, he has been devoting to actually see if the scientific evidence agrees with his theological viewpoint. I'm not quite as eager to do that. I'm, as you know me, I'm a little bit more reserved and I have to say there are times when I thought about young earth creationism, I said, if the data doesn't agree, then maybe the Bible's wrong. A lot of Christians don't want to say that, but I've been confronted. And I'm kind of at the point now where it's like, I can accept it by faith. And unless I see something that really breaks it, I'm, I'm going to just accept it by faith. But it's reasonable enough at this point that I can accept it. And it's gotten stronger every day, honestly, every day. I would read the scientific literature and stuff breakthroughs that we needed to have as young earth creationists. They've been coming through. So thank you for letting me cool. share that little bit of my testimony. Okay. So you were going to share a little bit about abiogenesis and then jump to the thing that I think nobody really talks about. 
Okay. Um, so okay. Get, give a little bit of abiogenesis and then let's get to that, um, the presentation. The presentation. Okay, let's start. Uh, the presentation will actually elaborate a little bit about the problems with abiogenesis because we're going to talk about protein complexity. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's some of where my peer reviewed secular publishing is, is in protein biology and also population genetics. So the first thing about abiogenesis, when I was going through school, it was the Yuri Miller experiment and they're bragging like, oh, we're gonna solve the problem of origin of life. It didn't take long before it started to spill out in the popular press. And let's see, I have a book here by Fred Hoyle. Fred Hoyle is the famous astronomer who coined the word Big Bang. And he wrote, he's a physicist and he wrote the mathematics of evolution. And it started to come out that the odds of abiogenesis are astronomically remote. Now, Fred Hoyle is an atheist, so he had to have some kind of different explanations than a traditional theist for that. And he came up with space aliens. But the point is, it went from we're almost able to solve the problem of abiogenesis to no, it's too difficult, too difficult for it to happen on Earth. The odds are too remote that we have to appeal to things outside of the earth like space aliens, because if you're not gonna accept God as an explanation, then you know, the next intelligent design, um, available intelligent designer would be space aliens. It's gotten so bad now. Okay, so this is like the 70s, 80s, et cetera. In the last 10 years, we're having top evolutionary biologists like Eugene Koonin weigh in on this and he's saying well you know we actually need multiple universes that we can't see test verify or prove but if we accept the eternal inflation of the big bang there there are other island quote unquote universes out there and we just happen to be in the right one uh, you know you need an infinite number basically and then but one of them will get all the odds right and that's how we explain the probability overcoming the improbability of life and, and they're, you know, it, it's, uh, Hoyle was very good at calculating. He was among some of those from the secular perspective, calculating the odds of the complexity of life. Now I need to just clarify a little bit. It's not the problem. It's not making life. It's accounting for the complexity. It's, a, it, it's almost the same thing, but you, I'm trying to frame it in terms, how do you account for these structures that are so intricate and interdependent like a machine? And he famously said that, and, and he was, this was actually published in a scientific journal, Journal Nature. He had a commentary. He said, uh, the odds of life emerging spontaneously are like uh, expecting a tornado to pass through a junkyard and make a 747 jetliner. And people have criticized, yeah, go on, Rebecca. No, I. that's the thing is that like, People are going to say, because I, I already know that, you know, there's people probably watching right now and th who are going to say, oh, but but that was a long time ago. Now you see, we figured it out all out. We know we know all these different steps, how they could have happened. And so we we're like on the cusp of like getting to the origin of life. So respond to that. Well, it's just, again, that progression. We went from we're almost solved to space aliens, to multiple universes. We're starting, to, when, when professional scientists of Eugene Kunin's caliber, he's the elite National Academy, and then there are others, when they're appealing to multiple universes to solve things, and you can't test or verify, you're appealing to their existence without any direct evidence, that's a faith statement. That's no longer, you know, <laughs> that's really no longer traditional science. So let's call it science, let's just call it very low quality science. High quality science would be the science that is used to make like say uh, geometric optics where you build the lenses for your contact lenses or glasses or you build your electrical appliances. You have 99.9999% confidence that if you have a system built and it's operating under these conditions, it's gonna do something that you predict and you're gonna be 99.999% of the time correct. Low quality science would be stuff like abiogenesis. They're like, we think it could happen this way, but we don't even know what the conditions actually were. But we're gonna just postulate it had to make it light. That's a face statement. That's not an empirical claim. So um, they'll keep saying it and the popular science writers will say one thing. And I'm just gonna, if I could just share my screen a little bit, 
and then we can go on to the other topic. Uh, let me see if I have it. This is Clemens Weikert. So this is this is in uh, Nature Communications. Nature is the number one science journal. This is kind of an auxiliary. And Clemens Weikert, I'm just going to read some of the stuff here. You can look it up. I think it's worth a read because he's pointing out a lot of these abiogenesis experiments, they are um, run by humans under conditions that are not really representative or prebiotic con conditions. So what they do is they take an experiment, it's a real experiment, they misrepresent it as being uh, a plausible condition when it's not, and then they use that to make a false assertion and then the science popularizers will take off with it. And he's saying, time out, this is not right. This is not legitimate science to be doing it this way. And if, uh, can, if you'll indulge me a little bit, I'll just read the abstract and if people wanna go back to it, we can, All right? So cool. experiment, experimentalists in the field of prebiotic chemistry strive to reenact what may have happened when life arose from inam inanimate material. How often human intervention was needed to obtain a specific result a specific result in their studies is worth reporting. How often human intervention was needed to obtain a specific result in their studies is worth reporting. And you can take that down now. If we want to revisit this again, um, he, he is, okay. you know, he's saying, let's just take some accounting. And so if we're going to be skeptical and say, okay, this is what the mainstream claims, but is it proven? Or is it a statement of faith? That's where I would begin. I'm not even going to go so far as and say, you know, this proves there's a God. Because I will pose these questions to the people that I engage with. And they say, well, we haven't figured it out. But that, you know, just because we haven't figured it out doesn't mean it implies God. And I'll say, okay, can you and I at least agree then that we haven't figured it out? Why then are you, why then is the mainstream insisting this is how it happened if they don't even know? They can just say, we insist it happened because that's our statement of faith, but they haven't actually proven it in terms of high quality science. High quality science is like what we see in applied physics, also known as engineering. So um, we can revisit this later, but if we, I can get people to just say, this is a statement of faith, we haven't proven it, I think we've moved, we've moved the conversation in the right direction because then it's my statement of faith versus yours which is more believable. Cool. Okay, so do you wanna to get to your presentation? Yes, let me try to bring it up. And if you have some words while I try to wrestle with the technical things. Yeah, well, I'll say hi to everyone and I appreciate you guys being here. It's good to have you guys. Um, Travis, Peter, Otangelo, Bro Guy. Cameron, and th there's a there's some questions for you in the chat, but I'll try to wait. I'll try to get those um, answered at the end. So this is what you were going to share that I feel like. Uh, well, I haven't actually seen this presentation yet, but I've just heard your briefing about it, and I feel like there's stuff in here that like doesn't get talked about a lot. Like we hear often about the idea of common ancestry, but um, do you want to introduce what sure. you're? I just wanted to say for the Christians out there, I have the story of Fazel Rana, for example. He wrote the book, I, I know it's kind of tiny to see, Origins of Life um, by Fazel Rana and Hugh Ross. It was endorsed by Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, Richard Smalley. Richard Smalley went home to be the, with the Lord. But what's amazing is that when you study cellular biology, there have been people, Fuz Rana was an agnostic, and when he studied biochemistry, particularly the cell membrane, he became a Christian. Richard Smalley, again, was using his chemical, his knowledge of chemistry and physics. He applied it to the origin of life question. He concluded that God is the better explanation than ordinary, what we call, call, quote unquote call natural processes. So that was my, this is gonna be my opening statement at my presentation. So what you're gonna see is it'll open with a blank screen and then I'm gonna give my technical presentation. But since I'm here with Rebecca, I'm not gonna just do a data dump. I would hope she'll be interact and give me some feedback. My audience is gonna be very sophisticated and 
Um, uh, so there'll be some terms I might have to clarify. So go ahead. Now, I just, I wanted to put this comment up before we got away from this because of the topic of abiogenesis real quick. So this says, so Sal should check out Professor Dave's videos on James Tour. Now I've seen Professor Dave's video, at least one of them. Um, and I've also seen Dr. James Tour's videos. Dr. James Tour's is very much more qualified to talk about this topic than Professor Dave is. Um, Sal, do you want to say a bit about those videos? After I heard the first 20 minutes of uh, Professor Dave, when he said it's easy to make any biomolecule, it's so easy, we, we have machines to make it, I said, you're totally dismissed. That's A lot of the professional biochemists in my circle were laughing at that because it is very difficult to make any biomolecule. That's why we actually have to have machines do it because it is so difficult. And uh, the, the, the professional chemists that I hang around and I, you know, some of my co-authors on secular papers are professional chemists, professors, in fact, of biochemistry, like uh, Joe DeWeese, we're going to talk about Joe DeWeese's work. He is a professor of biochemistry at the Vanderbilt School of Medicine and also Fried Hardeman, and he's published in journals. We're just laughing at Professor Dave. So uh, thank you for inviting me to watch it, but I, I have to give that a pass because I, I wrote him off after just hearing that in the, the 20 minutes that James Tour had to give because it, it just went from bad to worse. The more that I hear him talk, the worse it is. Now, he has invited some guests to try to defend the origin of life like Lee Cronin, and Lee Cronin would then do exactly what I'd say. He'd appeal to an experiment that is irrelevant, represent it as solving a problem that it never really solved, and then let the science popularizers get away with s suggesting that he uh, solved the problem he actually didn't. And, and it's, a, it's a misrepresentation and I consider it delusional at best and fraudulent at worst. I know those are harsh things to say, but you know, we can, yeah. we can argue the chemistry. Mm -hmm. Tonight we'll talk about the chemistry. Yeah, and no disrespect to Professor Dave, it's just that um, Dr. James Tour is, one of the top chemists in the world. Uh, yes. So, and if you, anybody who has not watched his series on abiogenesis, he is so thorough. It's like 13 parts long, I believe. And it's like an hour hours. each part. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's no. it, so I highly recommend anyone to watch that. If you are thinking about this topic, I mean. I highly recommend. Amen. Yeah. Um, let me point out, Professor Dave has a BA in chemistry. His master's, I think, is in education. James Tour has multiple PhD students in chemistry. James Tour worked for Richard Smalley. James Tour was instrumental in helping Richard Smalley become a Christian. Richard Smalley, again, they felt he is one of the top 50 most influential. He won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. He's the father of nanotechnology. So James Tour is persuaded and dealt with some of the top tier chemists on the planet. And he is a top tier chemist in his own right. So uh, not just in terms of qualifications, but if you do listen and you understand the chemistry, uh, you, you'll know he really won that exchange. So- um, And Aaron one says top chemist in what sense? How is that measured? Well, he's won many awards. He's published like tons of, papers he's reviewed yeah. uh, tons of um, papers he's he, i mean you can listen to if you listen to his first video responding to professor dave he lists his credentials and well, it's it's pretty astounding actually well th no this is a, actually a very good question so top chemist would train other chemists they these chemists would go on to be professors so that's one thing the other thing is you're actually able to create chemical reactions. So I talked about applied physics, applied physics, and applied chemistry. You're able to create conditions in the laboratory that'll make a certain chemical reaction. And it's not as easy as one might think. He was able to achieve chemical reactions and then make new chemicals such as graphene or various varieties of graphene. And when you're able to do that, that's how you show your tops. So some of his Chemical inventions have been used in medical devices. 
And you better get your stuff right if you're making something that's a medical device to help people, like say, with neurological diseases. And and so I would say that's how, you know, the proof of your skill is not just that you're lauded and appreciated publicly, but you've actually delivered with useful devices, useful inventions, uh, useful uh, chemical reactions and processes that have made the human condition better. And that's what I consider the measure of, that's what I call high quality science. High quality science delivers like that. Low quality science is just purely speculation. And, and, and that's what we're, you know, I've been criticizing the abiogenesis and evolutionary disciplines as low quality science. Now, just to be fair, people say, well, creationism isn't call it good science. And I'll say, well, I actually might even agree. I think, you know, miracles might be outside of science. It might be true, but maybe it's just not science. And that's how I would, that's how I would settle it. And I just say, I would accept it as faith. I'm not going to try to represent it as science. And I'm just asking the same of evolutionary theory and abiogenesis. Why don't they stop representing it as science? Represent it as statements of faith. Then we're on a level playing field. Yeah. So thank you for okay. the question, Erin. Yeah. Okay. Getting to your presentation. Okay. So there are many definitions of evolutionary theory, and I'm not going to try to define it. But almost, you know, almost uh, generally, it has a claim that all life, all the diversity of life in the present and represented in the fossil record descended from a, I hope you can see my cursor, descended from a prokaryotic cell, a single cell. We presume generally accepted it's a prokaryotic cell. And that prokaryotic cell diversified, had offspring diversified, and its, and its offspring, its uh, descendants ended up being all the creatures we see today, like the, mic the various microbes here on the left, the plants, dinosaurs, humans, and monarch butterflies. And if you could monitor the chat, it doesn't, you know, if anyone objects to, to that claim, uh, just speak up. Otherwise, we'll just move on. Is <laughs> well, that how you understand? Well, Lena saying a big wrong here. So, Lena, can you please um, uh, uh, clarify what, what's wrong? Thanks. Keep, keep right. going, Sal. I'll let you know. All righty. The problem is, can we say that all the parts that make up life, I, I, well, ev I didn't define evolution. I was just saying that's the claim of it. Is that is that wrong to claim that we all descended? Isn't that the claim of evolutionary theory? I didn't say that's the definition. I said that's the claim. And this is descent with modification. You're descending from a universal common ancestor. Okay. All right. So... But the problem is, what about the parts of life? Going from left to right, that's a, these are, these are some of the, they're like 20,000 proteins in a human being. But these are somewhat representative of the family. You can group them into families. So we have like on the left, a uh, um, multi-array zinc finger protein. A, then, then the next one, going left from, to right, this is a homo tetrameric potassium ion channel, a homo hic homohexameric helicase, homodimeric topoisomerase 2 alpha, a heterotrimeric collagen, and then a homodimeric insulin receptor. And there are many more. This is just a sampling. Can we say that all of these proteins descended from a universal common ancestral protein? And I'm going to say, no, it's wrong. There is no single ancestral gene slash protein, no single ancestral gene slash protein. And to be formally correct, you know, to be formal about this, I'll say no single ancestral gene locus. So, so the formalists out there would probably understand that. Now, if you doubt my claim, I went through a lot of trouble to find if an evolutionary biologist will agree with me. And I found out to my pleasant surprise, many of them would. They would agree with this statement. And if you doubt me, I have, I have evidence of that. I would 
posit the correct view is this thing we call an orchard. It's not a single universal tree where we have like one protein form and you could kind of build kind of like a, you know, a tree of variation from that, whether it's physical or conceptual, I'm not going to get into that, but this is the more correct viewpoint, independent lineages. So, so did I make this up? Am I out on a limb? Here is Dr. Daniel Stern Cardinal, and I'm going to play this recording twice so you can hear it. And he's an evolution. He has a PhD in evolutionary biology. biology. And so he's responding to this claim that you just made. Exactly. He is a professor of biology at Rutgers University. He and I have debated. We're on cordial. We have a very cordial relationship. I, I want. Um, I want to say that I, I regard him very highly and his opinion counts very, very much to me. We don't obviously agree on a lot of things, but this is, let me just play the recording and I'll, I'll play it twice. And I, I want you to try to digest what he's saying. Just give you a chance, yeah. I agree, no, but you, you definitely, it seems like you represented my views very accurately. Uh, which is that there is definitely not one single common ancestor protein that every protein that we see is descended from. You have multiple independent things yeah. appearing and, at different times. And that's an interesting. Just give you a chance. Yeah. I agree. No, but you, you definitely, it seems like you represented my views very accurately, uh, which is that there is definitely not one single common ancestor protein that every protein that we see is descended from, you have multiple independent things yeah. appearing and, at different times. And that's interesting. How do you like that, Rebecca? It, well, I mean, that sounds like it's a huge problem because this thing that's already incredibly difficult to do to get an origin of a protein, you've now you've got to get um, many different proteins to um come about like separately that's compound yes. your problem and then you've got different organisms so when did this happen uh and it, it can we trace that's i guess that's my next question then can we trace these different proteins uh to certain organisms and say you know they eventually branched off and oh these are big questions and, and I just, you know, um, I may not be able to directly answer the, the, the rhetorical questions you just, well, actually the direct questions you just asked. Um, if we could defer that and please, you know, if it doesn't clarify, sure. just keep reminding me. So again, the, the main evolutionary claim is that there's a universal common ancestor from which all life forms emerged. That's the scent with modification from a universal common ancestor. But you just heard Dr. Dan say that, well, for the proteins, the proteins slash genes that are, are really part of the part, you know, they're the components of life. They don't have a universal common ancestor. I want you to munch on why this seems to be a little bit in conflict. Now, He'll have a different solution for it. And to be fair, he'll say, well, these things pop up all the time spontaneously. De novo proteins happen all the time. Okay, so I want to be fair. And the fairest thing to do is to let him defend his views and articulate it. I'm going to give mine tonight. But the one thing we're in agreement with is the proteins, the proteins slash genes, really the genes that code for the proteins, have multiple independent origins multiple independent origins. So, uh, you know, what can happen, maybe to try to answer your question. So when we have this prokaryotic cell, when it becomes a eukaryote and like a hydra, it would have to spontaneously create these new protein families. And we talked about that problem. There's a video on the Examining Evolution channel. And I pointed out the problems with evolving eukaryotic components. Those eukaryotic components involve lots of different new proteins that you won't find in a prokaryotic cell. They just sort of arrived independently. They had no common ancestor. They just, they're like, well, poof, you know, I mean, that's, just, I don't know what else to say. 
it, it's almost like magic. And I'm like, well, it is magic. I believe it was a miracle, but you know, people that uh, believe it can happen naturally, that's, that's their faith statement. It's not provable though. And I've tried to argue if we go from the laws of physics and chemistry, I don't think it's reasonable to think this happens naturally. And um, I'm just gonna pause here a little bit and just invite people to think, when, at what point will the evidence be such that you'll accept a miracle as the explanation? I'm just leaving that as an open question for you all. Um, I, I know some will say, well, never. And that's like, okay, just that's fine as far as being honest with yourself. And there's some people's, you know, their limit would be, you know, maybe different than that. So I'm just posing that as a rhetorical question. So go well, on, Rebecca. If I'm just trying to think as maybe I'm trying to enter into the experience and thought process of some of the people in the chat, <clears throat> I don't know if for them this is a significant thing, you know, because what you're showing here, okay, all right, so what? Proteins had to, you know, they had an independent origin. No big deal. All right, we, we we can just, you know, assume that it happened. Um, so what is the like? What is actually the huge problem with this? Like, how does this mess up common ancestry as a concept? Oh, so I'm not. Oh, and that's a good question. So the remainder of this talk is actually to help explain to answer your question. So this isn't necessarily. This isn't a direct attack on universal common ancestry per se. It is an attack on the complexity of these proteins. And as I described the complexity, you'll see it's like, well, even if we assume common ancestry, you're going to have to assume things that are st st the statistical equivalent of a miracle, whether it's a theological miracle like God did it, or is it like some really remote astronomically imp improbable event? So when I say like a statistical miracle, it's like, okay, we're not going to say whether God did it or not, or multiple, multiple universes. We're just going to say this is a very, such an improbable event that we wouldn't expect to happen. So in qualitatively, we would say it'd be an improbable event for a tornado to pass through a junkyard and make a 747 or anything of comparable complexity. I mean, that's, we can state, we can say if something is a statistically improbable as far as far from natural expectation. And that's all I can establish. So most of this talk's going to be just the pure science. So we're, uh, you'll have to forbear with me because I know you sometimes, you rightly point out that I don't always get to the point. But part of the reason for that is I actually have to explain a lot of the terms so I can get to the point. So you'll have to forbear with me. Yes. Um, yes. So. Uh, just in passing, since I'm presenting at the Creation uh, Research Society, this is this slide is for the creationists. So for the people that are on the fence, consider that if if proteins don't have a universal common ancestor, maybe we could entertain the possibility that life doesn't have a universal common ancestor. And this is more friendly to the idea of creationism, be it older, young earth creationism. So that that's why I, I I'd thrown this out. This this looks like kind of like a conflict, but this looks more natural if you're willing to accept miracles. And that's one reason I accept miracles. So now let's look at the evolution of a car. Uh, you know, I, I was thinking, could I go just full biochemistry nerd stuff or try to make this accessible? So I'm going to just try to describe some of the concepts without getting deep in the biochemistry, and then we can get a little into the biochemistry. So this is kind of an evolution of the car over time. Like in the 1900s, we had the Oldsmobile curve dash and then the Ford Model T in 1910. Uh, the Chevrolet Impala in 1950, I actually owned an Impala, my family did. And then we had the Toyota Camry. So you could see that we can evolve a car through slight successive modifications to, to use Darwin's words. That's not particularly distressing. Granted, this is a design, but the point, you know, Darwin was conceiving of how we can incrementally um, improve on, on a design. Uh, he, he would argue nature did it naturally, but we can see that in the man-made world, we can, you know, make slight successive modifications and come up with something else. Now, I will point out, yeah, there are, roughly the same basic shape and it's believable, but you know, 
the car in 2010 and today has a lot of components like a cell phone, a GPS, computer controlled uh, engine management, ignition management, anti-lock brakes, um, airbags, uh, power steering, you name it. So even though that they're, you know, you could see this evolutionary progression, it's the parts that, it's the addition of new parts that kind of come out of nowhere that you don't see. So superficially, it looks like, uh, you know, descent with modification. And then we could do, so this is just kind of along one line, but you could actually show it in terms of a family. The actual, most people say that the first real car was in 1886, it's the motor wagon by Benz, Carl Benz, and that was it here. And it diversified into all these, the concept diversified into all these descents with modification. Do you have any problem here or comments or questions? No, I want to move on from the cars. I got the cars. Okay, this is great. I really like this dragster, by the way. Okay, that's, so that's my little tangent there. So this looks believable. How about this? Can we conceive of a component that you can modify with slight successive modifications to be all the parts of the car? And just retort, just to the audience there, think about it. Can I start with a functional, a functional component that I, with slight successive modifications, it's gonna become a tire or a gas tank or a piston or a spark plug or a radiator or a battery. And you can see this as an analogy to the protein problem. Can we conceive of a universal common ancestral protein from which all these complex geom uh, geometrically different proteins evolve? And the answer is no. And you heard, that's why I went through a lot of trouble to get Dr. Dan on my channel to agree with me on that. Because otherwise, since I'm a creationist, you, you guys might not believe me that I say this is the case. Well, now, Dr. Dan's it, watching as far as I can tell. I, think I hope Dr. so. Dan, yeah. So, so maybe he he'll, arrived he'll at his, chime in. Yeah, maybe he'll yeah. chime in. Go ahead. So he, okay, to be fair, he may have arrived at this conclusion from a different line of reasoning than I did, okay? So he may not agree with this line of reasoning, but he will ag agree with the conclusion. So we have maybe different lines of reasoning to arrive at the same conclusion. He may not like my line of reasoning. So to be fair, let me not try to suggest this is his line of reasoning to arrive at the same conclusion. So I, uh, Dr. Dan, if you're watching, okay. thank you. I'm honored, sir. And um, Yeah, he said he's in and out. So don't, don't count on him to be watching. Okay. So Dr. Dan, I'm not representing this as your line of reasoning. I'm just pointing out we had the same conclusion, but for different reasons. And this is my reasoning. So Rebecca, I'll ask you, does this sort of make sense? Uh, yeah, you know? but I would, what I'm, I think when people see these proteins like this, they don't, they're not getting the idea of the like incredible functions. Like it doesn't look comparable to the car. Uh, actually, these are more complex than the car parts. <clears throat> and this is why it takes so long. And I'm sorry that I don't get to the point because I have to, I have to make sure I'm not losing people <laughs> in the process of when I start to get technical. So we're in agreement there. And, unless people say this does uh, analogy doesn't apply. So let me just pick out th this protein, the, t uh, the tetrameric potassium ion channel, and I'll represent it. But there's another way to represent it. It looks like that. That's a that's you know that's a Richardson ribbon diagram, and I call that a God made nut. And, and look, see, it looks similar to the issues are ge geometry down at the molecular level. You have these parts; they have to connect. They have to be very precise. So there's a reason I'm pointing out car parts. The, the problems of connecting things with high precision happens in the cell. So now I'm gonna highlight the problem of minimal functionality. These parts have to be minimally functional, otherwise they're you know they're they're useless. And so let's take a radiator. A radiator has to have all the connections to the, to the, to the engine to 
pump out the hot water and pump back in the cool water. It needs to have heat exchangers and there are other things, but that's, it has to be minimally functional for, for it to exist as a device. Otherwise it's useless. So when they keep saying about natural selection evolving things, it's like, well, if it's not functional, it's, it should be thrown away and we have evidence of that. So let's go to a topo isomerase and now I'll talk about the complexity. Topo isomerase is more complex, I'll argue, than a radiator. We can build a radiator. We can't build a topo isomerase from scratch. This protein here is a target of chemotherapies because if you disrupt the topo isomerase enzymes function in a cell, you're going to kill the cell. So you could see why we develop chemotherapies, we disrupt the function of the topo isomerase that's going to kill the cancer cells. Unfortunately, it also kills healthy cells. We're trying to, you know, some of my work has been trying to improve the targeting of topo isomerase to kill the, the cells we want to get rid of, namely the cancer cells. So it has to have minimal complexity. Um, uh, during the, my presentation, it's, it's the courtesy to acknowledge my co-authors of the presentation. One of them is Joe DeWeese. I mentioned him earlier, a professor of biochemistry at Vanderbilt School of Medicine and also Fried Hardeman. He and I had published in the Creation Research Society uh, 2019 on the topo isomerase. By the way, Joe DeWeese is also a young earth creationist. But lest you think he's a run of the mill scientist, he's published in the top scientific journal in 2010, Nature, on the topo isomerases. I've had the privilege of publishing with him at the Federation of the American Societies for experimental biology in 2019 and then also in 2021. So that's my acknowledgement of my colleague who helped me develop this presentation. So now let's look at how the topo isomerase works and, and, and bear in mind this whole concept of minimal functionality. Let's consider what happens as DNA unwinds during replication. As DNA unwinds, it acts like this rope when we pull apart its two strands. As you pull the strands apart, twisting tension builds up in the rest of the coiled portion. It is actually adding one twist to the remaining rope for each twist pulled out of it. At some point, you can't separate the strands anymore. The remaining rope is too tightly twisted. If you relax your tension on the rope, it will twist around itself in a supercoil. It is releasing tension. If you want to keep pulling the rope apart, you have to release the tension periodically, and one way to do this is to cut the rope and splice it back together. This problem has been best characterized in small circular DNAs. There are two methods of dealing with this problem in DNA. One cuts only one strand of the DNA double helix, and the other cuts both strands. Let's look at the first. Topoisomerase 1 enzymes cut a single strand of the double helix, pass the other strand through the cut, and reseal the break, relaxing the overwound molecule, which now has one fewer twist. Topoisomerase 2 enzymes do the same thing but with both strands of the double helix. Topoisomerase 2 cuts both strands of a double stranded DNA and passes another double strand through the break and then reseals the break. So if a molecule of DNA is supercoiled, topoisomerase 2 can remove the supercoiling, two twists at a time, to yield a relaxed circle. Wow. Now, I just want to point out here that this topoisomerase has to know what needs to be done and accomplish the task. And we're talking about this, like having to independently arise with this function. This is, I don't know, uh, guys, I mean. <laughs> okay, they, they, showed a, they showed a rope. Can you build a machine that's going to uncoil or untangle the rope by cutting it and connecting it together, even with scotch tape? Just imagine the difficulty of doing this in the you know, the human, what we call the macroscopic world, just to appreciate all the steps that need to happen. To cut it, to pass 
you know, there's that step where it passes the other strand through the break. I'm just like, that's pretty tough. Remember, this isn't a single rope. These are double strands. And, and to do this, and you have to do it 100% efficient because otherwise uh, you have a break and you're not able to repair it, your cell's dead. I mean, this is happening and you have like 100 trillion cells in your body. And so all your you cells are doing this. if you don't have race, then how does this, what happens? If you don't have it, uh, as far as we know, you're dead. You're not even okay, alive. Okay, so then do you have millions of years to get topoi race? I don't think so. Now, some people will believe that. And, you know, to be fair, there could be some creatures out there that don't need topoi race, but anything as complex as a eukaryotic cell in we have eukaryotic cells, humans are eukaryotes. I, I, I don't think there's a chance and I'll explain why. This is not an argument from ignorance. It's an argument from contradiction. So if you look, and I studied mathematics, they had this thing called proof by contradiction. You just assume something is true and then you find out if it leads to something absurd. So let's just, this, let's just assume we can involve this in pieces and think about what has to happen. So this is a topoisom race, and I'll point out it looks a little bit like a pair of scissors. Obviously, you want it to, to be like a pair of scissors, and, and you can actually kind of see how it's going to be cutting and whatever. Uh, but it does more than a pair of scissors. It can, it can ligate, which is reconnect. After where it cuts, it's able to reconnect it. So we use the word ligate. But now let's – okay, so granted, this, this rendering a topoisom race – is a slightly different conceptual drawing than this one here. It's the same thing, all right? So that, you know, for illustration purposes, the, there's a little bit of artistic license. This one is definitely more artistic license. This is a more accurate representation with the Richardson ribbon diagram of the topoisomerase protein. But think what would have to happen. Uh, if you have a topoisomerase that you evolve in steps, let's say the first step is that it just cuts. If it goes through and cuts and sh shreds the DNA but doesn't stitch it back together, well, that's not going to work. <laughs> if it, <laughs> the, the creature's dead, natural selection's not going to work because the creature's dead. That lineage is gone, toast. So, um, okay, let's say that it can untangle, but it doesn't cut. Well, that's not going to work either. Or let's say it can ligate, that is reconnect, but it doesn't cut or untangle. That's not going to work. So this is what I talk about minimal complexity. Unless you have all three features there simultaneously, it's not gonna work. And particularly for topoisomerase, if it doesn't work, uh, the complex cell is dead. There might be some pathological examples that don't need topoisomerase, but for anything, for cellular life, not viral life, not phages or whatever, um, we'll need a topoisomerase. Now for bacteria, they have a homolog that we would call uh, uh, hetero, hetero tetrameric gyrase. So it goes by a different name, but it's the same function. So do you, do you have any comments uh, there, Rebecca? No, no, this is great. I'm loving it. So this, it. Is, this, is, this, is, this is evolution that can't – I'm just saying as a matter of principle um, – I think I would need more faith to believe it can evolve by natural selection and steps. That's just, you know, that may be me. That's my faith belief. And I'm just trying to point out the evolutionists have their faith belief that it can. And I'm all just, all I'm demanding is you admit it's a faith statement, that it's not ex to the level of experimental science. So that was, if we just stopped here, that was most of my presentation right there. So now, um, I hope that kind of addressed the evolution of complexity. Now we're just going to go into some anal details. This is now the nerd torture session of the lecture. Okay. <laughs> so this is about another 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. So let's say we had a random lump of metal and we could see that, okay, it could probably evolve into a rod and then to a nail. And then a nail could possibly evolve into a bolt. That's a very reasonable at least geometrically speaking, transition. And we have, we could see stuff in the fossil record that kind of looks like that, where we can imagine evolutionary transitions for biological creatures that are like that. But then we have things like the nut, or dare I say, like a topoisomerase. It just has to be fully formed from the start. You can't imagine kind of a gradual pathway. 
you think about what are the functional intermediates of a nut? Just, just think about if you had a random piece, how do you evolve it there? Try to describe the functional intermediates because the nut has to have be the right size. It has to have threads, right, correct? And then some means of being able to tighten it around the bolt. Uh, I'll point out it's very, it's unreasonable to think you can evolve a nut into a bolt. Okay, so this is going on to why there have to be independent proteins. I'm just trying to do the conceptually first, you know, without getting bogged down into the biochemistry and biophysics. Um, so we could say that survival of the fittest, that is Darwinian evolution, will actually prevent evolutionary change. Survival of the fittest will prevent evolutionary change. Random changes to a nut will cause it to be a bad nut be before becoming a good bolt. Therefore, natural selection nut will not evolve a nut into a bolt. And we can find examples of that in the protein world. And uh, we'll cover that, but I'm just trying to lay this out so you can see this is a question of geometry, just simple geometry. Um, you're not going to, it's going to be a bad nut. Random changes to this geometry uh, will result in functionless garbage. And that's, yeah. Okay. There's been a lot of good questions in the chat throughout, and I want to get back to some of them, but since this one kind of um, just goes along with what um, you're saying right now, I just want to put it up. Matthew says, is the implication of the last few minutes of slides just that irreducible complexity exists? Um, some things can be characterized as irreducibly complex. Um, some people have said that's a problem for evolution, and I just don't go there because um, when you come up with these abstractions like irreducible complexity, it's like, well, what? Do, how do you define it? The, you know, Dr. Dan, to his credit, he... He had Michael Behe on his show, and it and and it took 40 minutes to go through what what do you define irreducible complexity? And he would go through all these examples, and by the end it was like, uh, I think Dr. Dan made a really good point. It was a hard hitting thing, and it's like we spent so much time defining a concept, and we never actually started discussing the complexity. I would say I would call this irreducibly complex, but I kind of like prefer not to use that description. Um, and I think this is more about really just trying to show that like natural selection doesn't have the power to produce. Uh, it's not just about like the complexity. It's that where is the pathway? The we, pathway. We need a pathway to right. get there. See, this isn't a particularly complex thing right here. I mean, it's not. I mean, it is somewhat intricate, but it, you could see just the difficulty, even, even something trivial, uh, going from this to that. So I, I'll give a qualified yes, but I prefer not to argue that way. I prefer to argue specific examples like the Topoi Samaris, rather than say whether the question is not whether it's irreducibly complex or not. The question is, can it be evolved naturally? Can it be evolved by Darwinian selection? I would prefer to frame, see that a, a lot of the things in the origins debate is framing what the real question is. The question isn't whether it's irreducible, complex or not. The question is whether it is evolvable. I will just simply posit it's unevolvable un 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 for the reason stated. And I will tell you that even though there are papers that have claimed they figured out the evolution of Topoi race. it is more of a, um, oh, you're welcome, Matthew. It is more of statements of faith, not actual proof of mechanism. And Dr. DeWeese and I actually combed through these papers and we actually had a good laugh, honestly. Not, you know, we're not trying to be disrespectful, but we did start to laugh. <laughs> and, okay, so um, let me move on. So you can't evolve a bolt from a nut. And this problem is actually known in evolutionary biology and ev particularly evolutionary computation. It's called, it's called the, the problem of fitness landscapes where the intermediates, as I said, would be prevented. So um, for the aficionados, if they really want me to cover this diagram, I will, but I'll just move on because I think you get what I, where I'm, my drift. 
Conversely, you can't evolve a nut from a bolt. That doesn't make sense. And and I showed you earlier the God made nut, you know, they're the uh, potassium ion tetrameric uh, channel. There are things like a nut there. Now I'm gonna point out something else. So now we're gonna get a little bit of the complexity. We're talking about the geometry. There is a reason I was showing these mechanical parts. At the cell, there has to be basically a lot of mechanical type processes, but you add chemistry to it. So the problems you'll see in the macroscopic world with our tools of bolts and nuts and having them to be very precise occurs at the molecular level. This is from my essential cell biology by Bruce Alberts. You have two proteins here and they are shaped in a certain way so that they can connect. And, and additionally, where it had, you know, on the surface of these proteins are charges. And this is only a 2D diagram. You can imagine this in 3D, it's even more complex. But it will help bond the two proteins if in one protein it has a negative charge and on the counterpart it has a positive. So you get these bonds to bring them together. Think about the difficulty. This is trying to illustrate how come proteins have to be so specific in their shape. So you think this is precise. This is even more precise. This is not, this is precise on the order of maybe millimeters or microns. This is angstroms. This is angstroms. We can't achieve this sort of precision um, even if we tried at this point with our technology. I mean, we can, but with great difficulty. So these are shaped so amazingly precisely. And, and so the analogy, if anything, if they say, well, that's just an analogy, I'll say, well, I probably understated the problem when I'm using nuts and bolts. The problem is actually worse at the molecular level. Mm. So if I'm wrong, I've actually been wrong by understating the problem. So look at this bolt and nut. Random changes to this will compromise the system. If you had random changes in the geometry here, at best you'd hope you don't compromise it but you're not gonna improve the fit. You're not gonna improve the fit. This is why most random mutations are detrimental to the system. They may cause reproductive success, but that's not the same. You know, you can, uh, you can cause bacteria to lose some of their genes and they're gonna reproduce even faster. Um, and that's a whole nother topic. But um, basically random mutations will cause degradation of function for because of geometric reasons. And now this is what I really wanted to say because a lot of creationists will just talk about it's mostly you know detrimental without actually showing the principles why. This is why I love this diagram. And I said it has to be in three dimensions. So this is a little kid's toy puzzle. And this is kind of like a three dimensional puzzle. Um, it reminds me of this EZH2 protein that's part of the polycomb repression complex. And let me just show the picture. You see that, how they connect? All the parts have to beautifully connect. And if the only, the only weakness of the analogy is this thing is way more precise, way more complicated, way more intricate, more unimaginably difficult to construct than this. That's where the analogy fails. I've, I've actually understated it by using you know, human-sized analogies here, but this is a really cute picture. Yeah, this was from a peer-reviewed paper, by the way. So I'm not, you know, I'm not making stuff up. So now there are some transitions that are geometrically reasonable, meaning I could take a random lump, I could make a nail, and a nail is kind of like a straight piece of metal and it looks kind of like a wrench. So geometrically, you can conceive of it being evolved, but the question is, is it functional? along the way. So a, mut a, mut a mutating nail will become a bad nail before it can become a good wrench. Even if, it's not, even if it is not an incrementally reasonable transition from the standpoint of geometry, actually that, that's a mistake in my PowerPoint. I have to change that. Even if it is an incrementally reasonable transition from the standpoint of geometry, it is not reasonable from the standpoint of functional intermediates. This is gonna be a bad nail before it becomes a good wrench. Why did I point this out? It's the problem of co-evolution that we see in biology. What good is a wrench if it doesn't have a nut? Of course, my, it, it has, the function of the wrench is defined by things like a nut. And 
um, in biology, there has to be a lot of, there's a lot of factories in the cell. There have to be tools to make parts and to assemble the parts. And you have the same problem. And if anything, I'm only understating the problem at the molecular level. I mean, this is really trivial here, okay? So we, we could go with spark plugs. I'm just gonna skip that. Um, if we have, in the interest of time, if you want me to cover the spark plug, I can. I'll talk about promiscuous domains where they have to do a lot of gene splicing and splicing them together, which is just ridiculous. We'll go into the CDART database at the NIH and domains and what these diagrams mean, but we'll skip that in the interest of time. So I pointed out my reasoning for the orphan gene problem. And Dr. Dan would probably agree with this diagram. And again, just to emphasize, he would agree with the conclusion, maybe not the same reasoning. So now we're gonna go into the final stretch of the presentation. Uh, Walter Remine was the father of, the co-founder of the field of baromenology. At the presentation, people will know that, that's the study of created kinds. He talks about discontinuity systematics. That's a fancy term for like things that are unevolvable. And I've tried to demonstrate they're unevolvable as principle. Now, the reason I'm gonna show this is there are actually good arguments for evolution. I'm not saying it's wrong, but it's like this pencil that looks bent. This pencil looks bent as it's dipped into the water, but it looks bent. You could have an argument that it, it's actually bent because superficially it looks like it's bent. And I would say evolutionary theory is like, well, it looks like it's evolved, but it's actually not. This pencil is actually straight, but it looks bent. Uh, e um, and it took thousands of years until someone called Willibord Snell created Snell's law to explain the phenomenon. Likewise, it seemed reasonable to say that the sun and the moon orbited the earth and same, you know, et cetera, because you'd see the sun rise and set every day. So it's like, okay, that means it's going around the earth. But the truth is actually more subtle. In fact, this looks very reasonable. You can make predictions with this and it, you know, scientifically it's like 99%, you know, 90% correct for a lot of things in the ancient days, you know, uh, ancient times, but they had a few anomalies, what they call retrograde motion that they couldn't explain. And that's important. A very subtle anomaly required us to explore the possibility of a heliocentric solar system where the earth orbited the sun, the planets orbited the sun, the moon orbited the earth and the earth rotated. It, the truth was actually way more complicated than we ever imagined. And it took one anomaly to bring all of geocentrism down. The reason I'm pointing this out, I think the reason people believe in evolutionary theory is they can be, if they look at things superficially, they can come to the wrong conclusion. They could think that this pencil is bent when it's not. They could think that the that the universe orbits the Earth when it actually doesn't. So superficial appearances can persuade you, and you'll see why I brought this example specifically. In fact, um, Stephen Gold, the famous paleontologist, asked the rhetorical question. He said, "Did he, God, create to mimic evolution and test our faith thereby?" He's pointing out that things do look evolved, and I'll actually agree with him. I'll say they look evolved like the pencil looks like it's bent, and it's not, okay? Is God being deceptive by giving us these things? And it's like, well, no, he's given you the means to figure out that the pencil actually isn't bent, it's actually straight. So you'll see why I pointed this out. So let's look at collagen here. It's a protein that you could buy at Walgreens, it's a beauty product, but actually 25% of the protein mass in our bodies are collagens. Um, all proteins are made pretty much by these amino acids here. These are the chemical diagrams, but we can summarize the amino acids in terms of, um, we can represent them with English alphabetic letters for each of the amino acids. So A is the amino acid alanine and Y is tyrosine, et cetera, et cetera. And so protein basically when it's translated, it's basically a very long string of amino acid letters. This one is 1,464. I'm wrapping it around so you could actually see it. And so this is a spelling of collagen in humans, one of the, one of the paralogs. And do you see a pattern here? 
there's a non-random pattern here where all the G, you know, for a section there, every third letter is a G, which is a glycine. So I'll, I'll pause here, Rebecca, if you have any questions. Nope, you can keep going. Oh, fabulous. But there right, are a lot of questions in the chat, so I'm just letting you know. I'm going to get to those eventually. If, as I think I could finish them. in six minutes. Cool. Okay, we'll try. So th this is another protein, the zinc finger protein. Zinc, zinc finger 136. It's a human protein. And there's a pattern here. It's non-random. That's very important. The, the zinc ion has to connect to these. It has to be properly spaced. They're actually going to be uh, like 12 or 13 zinc ions connecting here. So, so this pattern is very important to the function of that protein, just like this pattern is very important to the function of the collagen. So, and they're higher order patterns. The point is, can you see now, this is where I'd say Dr. Dan and I probably have the similar line of reasoning. He saw patterns like this and he said, yeah, we put this through a sequence aligner, you can't get a common ancestor protein slash gene. It's very obvious you can't, all right? So that, so far we're in agreement there. The problem for creationists, and I have to give credit to the evolutionists where it's due, is the human, the human zinc finger, for example, looks very much like the pigs. You can see it has the same architecture. And if we did like a one by one comparison of each of the amino acids, it's about 50 to 60% similar. And so when these Christian creationists go off to college, they'll see this, they'll say evolutionary theory is true. There is a universal common ancestor for all creatures. So we got to deal with that, all right? So I'm being up front and you can build these, these trees. So I showed trees before that were vertical. This one has to be out kind of on the side and you can build all these trees of diversification based on that gene slash protein. Uh, but again, I'm gonna argue this is like the bent pencil. It's, it looks one way, but it's actually not. We can do the same for collagen. The, the human collagen's on the left. The zebrafish collagen's on the right. They're 75% similar. Superficially then we'd say that's evidence in favor of universal common ancestry. Let me grant that for the sake of argument. The problem is you have independent origins of proteins, which means even if you assume universal common ancestry of all organisms, you have to pretty much invoke miraculous origins for the major protein families. So if you're having to do that, granted that's not young earth creationism, but if you're having to invoke miracles to rescue universal common ancestry, how's that different than special creation, except maybe the chronology? Um, we could say like, for example, you have a piano and there are variations of the piano. And we could say then, okay, they're like variations of the collagen, one for humans, one for the zebrafish. And then you have the basic blender architecture and there are various variations of that and same for the television. But you can't evolve a piano into a blender and have functional intermediates or go from a blender to a television set. And the rest is, you know, I'm just citing um, what Dr. Dan might cite to make the argument from his perspective. And I will, I'll cite some other things in my abstract. This is one of my co-authors, Henry Whitler. And then I mentioned John Sanford, by the way, he broke the record in the journal of mathematical biology. Uh, it was the most watched article and I've had the privilege of working with him and I'm almost done. We got to publish in the press, uh, in, uh, Springer Nature reference handbooks. It's on university library shelves. It retails for $1,500 and I don't get a dime, so don't buy it. Just for my account, you can buy it if you like it. But you can get it a discount in Walmart and that's pretty much all I have to say. So thank you very much. Hi, am I Hi. back? Were you, were you, I think I was gone. But you were, did, did you, were you here the whole time? Yeah, I, 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 uh, I finished up. Oh, we're frozen. Okay. Did you take down your presentation? Cause I don't see it. Yes. Yes. I took it down. I don't I'm see done. your presentation. Okay. 
Okay. And, and thank you all. All right. So you ready for questions? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this comes from Bro Guy. Has your entire presentation been anything other than a statement of faith? What is this? So do you, was this it, a it statement is, of it, faith? How much faith was this to describe the difficulty of evolving a, how much faith was involved in pointing out the parts of a Topoi Sam race and what has to be minimally functional? That's a fact. In fact, you can knock out those pieces of the Topoi Sam race, it'll be dead. That's a fact. Uh, that's why we built chemotherapies to disrupt its function. So that's a fact. It's a fact that Dr. Daniel Stern Cardinal said, came to the same conclusion that not all proteins descended from a single gene slash protein, ancestral protein. That's a fact that he said that. And it's a fact that a lot of biologists probably believe that. And um, so that wasn't a statement of faith. Um, okay. Can you ask Sal, this is from Travis, why he is a Christian if he admits that intelligent design isn't about theology? So he's referring maybe to something you said in the past. You said like intelligent design isn't about theology. I, I may or may not have said that. And certainly some of my okay. views may have changed. Okay. So, um, I say ID is just claiming, okay, there is the traditional design argument, which is natural theology. Um, and I, I would, if I'd said something different in the past, then you can say that it's superseded by what I'm saying now, that if you study Hume, look at the tele teleological argument in Wikipedia, and you'll see that the design argument, it has lots of theological, it, I would say it has theological implications. So Paley's watchmaker, uh, that was called natural theology. It was the design argument. So um, can you ask Sal why he's a Christian if he admits that ID isn't? So I would say ID, classically, it is theology. The modern version promoted by the Discovery Institute tries to say it's science. I try to say, I don't care what you call it. The question is, are we designed? How we classify it is secondary. That's, you know, um, so call it what you want. The question is, are, are, is there intelligent design or can this happen by natural ordinary processes? So thank you for the question. Okay, I'm looking and guys, I'm just scrolling through the chat and I'm if I miss your question, like it will really help me out if you put your questions again because I'm like, there's a lot to go through here. Uh, so I'm going to go all the way to the end because I can't possibly scroll through this entire chat. So if you still want your question answered, okay, here, here's, here's one. And then I'm going to go to the end. So is it more reasonable? This is from Matthew to first doubt science or first doubt your interpretation of the Bible is the scientific method or are biblical hermeneutics more subject to error? Uh, can I try to answer the second question first? Sure. I don't know for the second one. And that's the honest truth. Um, and it depends on, you know, there are levels of quality of science. As I said, you have what I call high quality science, which is applied physics, applied chemistry, applied engineering. You can make, I mean, it's like you expect an airplane to behave a certain way under certain conditions. That's high quality science. We have very low quality science, which is like the field of abiogenesis and evolutionary theory that doesn't have a lot of experiments you can run on it. So that's the first distinction I would make. So if we say it's the scientific method or biblical hermeneutics more subject to error, I would say, I'm gonna get a lot of flack for this. I think, I don't like hermeneutics that much because it's interpretation. And the, okay, I'll tell you why. You can get a bunch of engineers together, say they're electrical engineers and they're gonna build an antenna. They're all gonna agree about how it's gonna behave pretty much. You can't get a bunch of theologians to agree on what the truth is. And I have a problem with that. Okay, I'm sorry to be harsh, but you know, um, 
when you're an engineer, you, ex you expect people to agree with you for the very fact your devices work. And we don't, you know, the way we resolve, the way we will resolve disputes is to have an experiment that'll show who's closer to the truth. Right now in the world of hermeneutics and theology, it's like, well, how do you, how do you prove who's right? And that's the thing I have a problem with. So I'm sorry to step on people's toes. All right. So cool answer. Uh, um, now this one, I'll take this one, Sal, because this is from Jesus Wizard Spatula. How does any of this prove your God doctrine beliefs? And you can answer it too if you want, but I just want to say it doesn't. Well, it doesn't. Yeah. Nice. Are you asking me? Are you Good asking answer. me why? Are you asking me why you should believe it? I, you don't have to. But I would, I would counter that. Why do you believe abiogenesis is true except by faith? I've tried nice. to give arguments. Well, yeah, so. Okay, uh, Travis says, is God designed or no? I don't believe he's designed. That's a, that's a faith statement. Thank you for the question. Can you show in a lab how an immaterial mind can make material things? There may be an answer to that. Uh, look up Wheeler's double slit delayed choice experiment and his um, self-reference. Uh, it's called like a self-referential universe, a universe self-creating. And, and it's kind of close to that. And so there are experiments in the lab that indirectly suggest it. So that the answer is that it's not a direct proof Look up the world, uh, the, there's a paper by Richard Con Henry from Johns Hopkins University, my alma mater, on the mental universe. It'll talk about the quantum mechanic experiments that suggest that it's an immaterial mind, AKA God that created the universe. You won't see it in his nature article, you'll see it in his other writings, and that's from a physicist. Cool. Um, this is from the great eyed yam. Does Sal believe in God because of the information presented tonight, or does he believe because of his experience as a teenager? I'd say both, but the one that takes priority is the kind of the information I presented tonight and more and more. Um, so can thank you. Can you elaborate That's on that? Yeah. Can you sure. elaborate on that? Sure. Well, there are conditions, uh, you know, where you could have visions that could be just something that's a chemical reaction in your mind. Obviously, when you dream, you have, you see things. And so you, you can't eliminate, you know, we tend to think that, I mean, there's also the Charles Bonnet syndrome. You get, we know that elderly people will actually start to see things that aren't really there and they have to be counseled and say, that's a neurological problem. So it's like, okay, then what will I take as priority as far as truth? And I said, then what I study is physics and chemistry. And, and so my study of physics and chemistry have suggested to me that abiogenesis wasn't natural. Therefore, there's a miracle. And if there was a miracle, there had to be a miracle maker. People will say that's God of the gaps. People have criticized. I said, I think God of the gaps is a really good argument. If Jesus healed you and you're a blind man, I'd say, well, that's a God of the gaps. I, I'm not going to assume it's uh, a natural explanation. I said, that's an act of God. So that's how I feel about a by you know the origin of life and the evolution, you know the emergence of complexity. Thank you, thank you for the question. Dessel Drace says, "Can Sal talk about what a continuous reaction network is and why he doesn't consider it a good response to his criticism about human intervention in prebiotic synthesis?" Well, we could, if you'd like, we can just read off the the clemens Weikert discussion of, of these reaction networks. Uh, it's in the paper. I would, I would defer to that paper that I cited uh, on the Hand of God Dilemma. And the title of the paper, uh, Prebiotic, it's called Prebiotic Chemistry and Human Intervention. And let me see if we have re continuous react. It makes sense to reduce the number of interventions required for an experiment by employing non-invasive spectroscopic techniques 
in building on known reaction networks that produce multiple biomolecules in one solution. Okay, and, and, and I'm just gonna read this paragraph. The power of multidimensional NMR, that's nuclear magnetic resonance, resonance spectroscopy, combined with modern mass spectrometry, allows one to monitor multiple biochemical species in one solution over extended periods of time. The analysis of the data can be a time-consuming jigsaw puzzle to solve, but is well worth the effort, given that this can minimize the number of interventions. So his question was, what the continuous, uh, what can Sal talk about what a continuous reaction network is and why he doesn't consider it a good response to his criticism about human intervention in prebiotic synthesis. Okay, the response to this is when you have these continuous reaction networks that don't have a lot, if you, and, you, and you've proven you've not done a lot of human intervention, you end up not creating complex molecules. We know that for a fact. And, and that was the whole thing. Let's keep monitoring it because he's trying to keep the, publish, the people who publish these experiments honest. And if he's starting to find the accounting is showing that there's interventions, then those experiments are, are written off. And I can tell you like when Dave Farina was saying that it's easy to synthesize any biomolecule, I'm like, okay, let's do a, let's do a human synthesis of DNA. We actually know a certain, you can look at it, the artificial synthesis of DNA on Wikipedia. You can definitely see that this is not a continuous reaction network. It's, it's compartmentalized kind of recipe like making a pizza. And Rebecca made a video on making a pizza, how you follow a recipe, the steps have to be in order. So uh, the problem for abiogenesis researchers is when they remove human intervention, the results are not very interesting. You just end up with a dead chemical soup. You start off with one that's dead and you have one that's pretty much dead afterward. And it's probably gonna stay that way forever. So. Um, Thank you for the question. Oh. Okay, sorry. Midnight Rambler says, why does Sal think comparing things that don't reproduce are a good metaphor for biological evolution? That's a good question, thank you. I was talking about the parts of life, the parts of life. It's, we're talking about the evolution of the parts, not the organism. So it is a good metaphor if we're talking about the parts, not for the whole organism. And I, I made the distinction earlier in, in the slides. I say, you know, like you had the cars. I said, okay, you could see the evolution of the cars and that's acceptable. But what about the parts? And, and it, independent whether you think this is good or bad, what do you think? Do you think the, these things, the real question is independent of how I presented it, do you think the topisomerase were all these complex geometrically shaped proteins that have precision down to the angstrom? Do you think that those things can emerge naturally? That's the real question. Okay. Um, gorgeous Roddy Chrome says, what is the significance of the phrase Darwinian selection? Is that somehow different from natural selection? I'll tell you why I used the phrase. If you say natural selection, you're assuming this is what happens naturally and that selection happens naturally. Neither are true. Um, neither are true because what they represent, okay, Darwinian selection is like, okay, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna evolve something as complex as the eye from precursors. And I'm like, okay, that only happens in your imagination. That's not what happens in nature. That's why I don't like to use the word natural selection. You're already cool. giving away the premise. And I'm trying to point out, you know what I really wanted to say, and it's more insulting, I wanted to call it fantasized selection, but that's a little bit too inflammatory. <laughs> if I said this evolved, the evolutionaries <laughs> are claiming this evolved by fantasized selection, I'd say, I'm going to laugh. But that's actually what they're doing. They're fantasizing this is what happens in nature, and they're telling you it's called <laughs> natural. And I'm like, no, that's not natural. That's why I use the different. And by the way, on a more serious note, that was what our Springer Nature publication was about. It's now on university library shelves. We had to go through peer review to show it. And did we use creationist material? No, we cited evolutionary biologists themselves pointing this out. You just don't hear it in the popular press. They've been honest 
you had enough integrity to say, to point out these problems, that this isn't what really happens in nature. And so we just put this together and the ed editor is like, you gotta be, it's like, what? It's like, well, what have we cited that isn't mainstream? It's just obscure. But it was written by senior people like Richard Lewinton and Joe Felsenstein. So you're laughing when I said that fantasize selection. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you for um, the question, gorgeous Roddy Crone. Great to see you. Peter W. says, why won't people accept God for an answer? Uh, you know, it's, uh, I have an answer for that. You know, uh, and I, I want to just be a little empathetic to the atheists and agnostics out there, first of all. Because sometimes the Christ some Christians, not me, will say it's because they want to do evil things. Well, there are some people that may be the case. But for a lot of ordinary people, it's like, well, what would make you believe in God? Well, because you'd want God to be as real to your senses as the air you breathe. And I think that's the main reason. God, so why won't people accept God for an answer? I would say it's because God is hidden. It says in the Pro Proverbs 25, 2, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search it out. And it also says the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden, treasure hidden in a field. And so God ordains reality that you won't find him for the most part unless you're looking and you're willing to dig and go in a field and dig and all you get is dirt. And it's like, well, I didn't find any treasure. And you keep digging until you find the treasure because God makes it really easy for people to close their eyes. And so that's kind of a disturbing thing, honestly, is that the reason people don't believe in God, I think is God actually makes it easy for them not to believe. He's trying to find the people that are willing to pursue him and love him and serve him and make him the Lord of their life. Thank you for the question. Awesome. <laughs> Um, Jesus Wizard, Wizard Spatula, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Then why isn't this written in the Holy Scriptures? I'm <laughs> okay. We what? don't know what you're okay. referring to. <laughs> okay, so there, there, okay, let me take a stab at it. Okay, I want right. to thank you for the question. Um, why didn't God talk about genetics or whatever in, in the Bible? I think he's. Again, Proverbs 25, 2, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search it out. He hid all these wonders of biology for the 21st century for us to discover that there is a creator in this day and age. So <laughs> this is part of this plan. Travis asks, is Sal admitting that faith is silly? No, because then you would have to admit your faith, in, if you believe in abiogenesis and evolutionary theory, if you accept that premise, then your faith is silly. Thank you for the question. Um, I would see. actually say it's sillier okay. than mine. Okay. Um, I'm trying to make sure I'm not skipping any questions, but the chat has continued to move fast. So well, this is great. See. How many how many viewers do we have now? Um, right now there's 25. So okay. um Okay, this is a repeat question. I'm not going to put that up because it's just, you already answered it. So, yeah, let me see what this says. Given the fact that we can't ask evolution, can we ask God to produce material in a controlled environment to link our observations with his work? Yes, we can ask and he can decide not to appear. And this is actually, a, I know kind of, I'm going to guess a little bit and please forgive me if I'm, misunderstanding your point. We tend to believe in things we can understand, control, and repeat. And that's the scientific method. The problem with the question of God is, all right, let's say hypothetically, you could tell God to show up in your experiment. He can show up and do exactly what you demand. He can do it as many times as you ask and um, how you want it. At that point, you're God, all right? It's not gonna work. So the question you have to ask yourself, and I, I totally get it. And I've asked certain, you know, one atheist said, I, the way I'll only, the only way I'll believe in God is if I could be God for five weeks. And I said, there's a certain logic to that because we tend to believe what we can understand, control and repeat. To believe in God is to maybe accept the fact 
you're going to believe in something you can't explain, you can't comprehend, and you can't control. But it doesn't mean he doesn't exist. And Justin Martyr said, and I don't remember who gave me this quote, he said, a God you can comprehend is no God at all. So I, I understand the sentiment. And that's one of the problems in putting faith and trust in a God you can't control, you can't tell what to do, and he won't show up on your demand. And, you know, I, I get that. I, I, I totally get that. And that's just something each, everyone who's considering the faith has to wrestle with. That's good. That's a really you good question. You always inspire me. Sal, I love your answers. You're just inspiring me so much right now. Um, can Sal explain Christianity using naturalism? There are some people that have tried. I can't. I can't. I think that there has to be a point of miracles. And I do get criticisms for saying Christianity is God of the gaps. Um, because when the word of God was confirmed by the signs and miracles, the apostles worked that I don't think that's naturalism. If I may, if you'll indulge me, can I try to answer what naturalism is? Um, and the philosophers out there may have their definition. I'll, I'll kind of give a little like uh, kind of a little summary of how I define it. Because this is, this yeah. is actually, okay. So most of the laws of physics can be expressed. If you want to define naturalism in terms of the laws of physics, these are the five laws of physics here. This is a, a summary by Walter Bradley, the fundamental laws of nature. The, this isn't exhaustive, but this covers a lot. The equations here represent most of physics. Mechanics, Hamilton's equations, electrodynamics, Maxwell's equations, statistical me mechanics, Boltzmann's equations, quantum mechanics, which is represented by Schrodinger's equation, but it's really larger than that, and general relativity. These are second order partial differential equations. I can't explain the miracles of Jesus with this. And I, I, I therefore think miracles lie outside these laws formally stated there. So that was a long-winded answer to uh, Travis there asking, can I explain Christianity in terms of naturalism? Cool, 13, turn, I, I don't know if this is 13th black hole, oracle, I don't know. Okay, Qu question, why are you assuming complex modern proteins in abiogenesis when you just need basic proteins to start the autocatalytic recursion. Complexity can increase afterward. Complexity was not des described to increase afterwards, and wherever it leads, it's not going to be cellular life. The question is, um, first off, these things, these complex autocatalytic recursion uh, reactions, like the Gadiri peptide, that's one that's often cited, and I kind of laugh, uh, he actually had to take stuff from biological organisms. Uh, and um, that reaction went nowhere. It's a dead end. It's not going to evolve in, into complex life. It might become a little bit more complex, but it's going to be stuck in that. These autocatalytic, so let me describe an autocatalytic reaction. It's going to make more of itself. And it's gonna just keep making more of itself. If you have a little increase of complexity, it's just gonna make more of itself. But the thing we found in some of these reactions, the thing that is less complex is selected for because it's metabolically more simple. So the thing that reproduces faster is the thing that's selected for and it ends up being simpler. That's, if you look up on the Wikipedia entry on the Spiegelman experiment, you'll see this. <coughs> so, um, you know, if you're gonna have there is a great Discovery Institute video, the long story short, look up evolution news um, and then just Google long story short on cell membranes. Uh, these autocatalytic recursion uh, systems will not make a cell membrane in a phospholipid bilayer. And I could show you videos of this where you have to have a transmembrane protein that has to be pretty complex from the get-go, not to mention translocation processes. And so you can, we can have all these autocatalytic reactions and say it increases complexity. Will it lead to the transmembrane protein system? And it will not. We can, by the way, that's a testable prediction. 
You're not going to achieve that in the lab without human intervention. And again, that's the hand of God dilemma that Clemens Weichert was referring to. That's actually, that's an excellent question because now we're getting into chemistry. Thank you for your question, sir. Um, so the outsider humus, humanist says how many, you have how many degrees, Sal? I have five, four are accredited, one I'm claiming that's unaccredited. I have a bachelor's in computer science from George Mason University, a bachelor's in electrical engineering of the minor in music from George Mason, bachelor in mathematics, minor in physics from George Mason, a master of science in applied physics from Johns Hopkins University, and an unaccredited, what I claim a master's in science in biology from the FAES graduate school at the NIH. That can be contested because it's unaccredited and it's, I'm just claiming it so far. I'm hoping by the time what it's all over, I'll have just seven. claiming it. What do you mean it's unaccredited? Like they don't, they don't have the, they're, they're not able to do, confer a degree. So I just okay. say I took enough classes and the fact that I'm published. So if you want, if they want to dispute it, you could say I have four accredited degrees so far. Um, I'm plan I'm hoping okay. I'm working toward to get more. Thank you for the question. Okay. Um, let's see. I feel like I've already put this one. I, I, I had this one. I don't know. It, it, it music must be spamming me. Um, cause I've seen this one like five times. You already answered this though, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So he can we ask God, that and you could say, yes, you can ask God. And if he tells you to take a hike, he might not show up in your experiment. So I can't control that. I mean, it might affect your faith, and I respect that. I mean, okay. I, I, okay, maybe that was a little too harsh. I get it. Okay, I nearly lost my faith. I was praying to God. You know, let's not let's take a more personal example. I was praying God would save my dad's life, and dad died. So, it's, so I, you know, I, I get the sentiment there, sir. I, I'm not trying to be too dismissive. That's a very reasonable thing, and there are a lot of people that have have very sincere seekers of God that didn't have their prayers answered. So I'm not trying to be too harsh there. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Travis wants to know, Sal, are other gods hidden or made up? I think the other hidden gods were made up. Mm -hmm. There's another category. It could be demons in the new Testament teaches that when people sacrifice to the idols, they're sacrificing to demons. So uh, it's not an either or thing. It could be a, a third category. So um, I'm not going to try to prove it because it's, a, you know, I'm basing that on my belief in the New Testament. I think some gods are made up. And I'll give you one example. <laughs> they almost treat Darwin like a god, and it's kind of funny. Another example is like Kim Jong-un. You know, he's presented to some deity. And definitely the emperor Hirohito in World War II who was considered a, a living deity, and that kind of was fell apart after uh, Imperial Japan was defeated in World War II. So I think that was a made-up deity for political reasons. Thank you for the question. Bro guy wants to know which creator. I think it's the Christian God, and that is that actually is a good question, and it ties to young Earth creationism. This book, Genetic Entropy, and I work with Dr. John C. Sanford, it posits that human life on earth is recent. And that would agree then with the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter three. If then the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter three accords with what we can use science to determine the, the true age of humanity, then that would suggest this is a divine origin. And therefore I would pick the creator, not to be any other God, but the Christian God. And also to, to the extent we get evidence that Noah's flood really happened, that would again be evidence that it's the Christian God, not the Hindu God, not the Islamic God, but the Christian, the Judeo Christian God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thank you for the question. Um, Imusig wants to know, he wasn't he wasn't hidden to all the Bible stories. Like, I think he's trying to say, well, if he's hidden, then why wasn't he hidden to all the people like in the Bible? He's mostly hidden. 
he said them to us, but um, he chose he chose certain people like the Apostle Paul to reveal himself in Damascus. When Jesus rose from the dead, he revealed himself to 500 people. If God chose, he could have just been, you know, Jesus could have just walked and presented himself to the Pharisees and that'd be the end of it. Uh, but again, this is it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, the glory of kings to search it out. Oh, he, yeah. I can give my reasons, but we can, unless someone asks, I won't give the reasons. Anyway, Dessel? Yeah, and he, by the way, he said thank you for answering his question earlier, and this is kind of a follow-on. Do you want oh, to stand you. by your claim that nothing interesting occurs? Why is this uninteresting? And he's referring to a continuous reaction network, no intervention that produces RNA precursors in 2020. Oh, I think it's interesting. But let me point out something with RNAs. Are you going to have a? Are you going to have the right proportions of adenine, cytosine? Actually, it should be adenosine. Now my chemistry is going to be messed up. A, C, T, U, adenine, cytosine, guanine, uracil, the bases. The RNA half-life of cytosine is like 19 days. The other ones could be as long as 80 years. You're going to have radical disproportions. It's not, you're not going to make, can you make, can you make like say an RNA world that doesn't have cytosine in it? And so it's like, you, you know, interesting is in the eyes of the beholder. So I'll say it's interesting. It's not, you know, it's not going to, it's not going to polymerize. Look at RNA syn synthesis, artificial RNA synthesis. And tell me if you think that that, uh, this continuous reaction network will solve the problem of RNA synthesis where you need step reactions. You have to have one reaction kind of protect, protecting groups to keep it from, um, uh, getting attached to the wrong thing. Also in an impure environment, you're gonna get a lot of that. It's not gonna polymerize. So if you say, um, why is this uninteresting? It's okay, let's say it's interesting. It, it's again, one of these irrelevant conclusions. It, it, it's rendered moot by other reactions. That's the problem is it's giving the, these researchers are giving the impression that this is gonna solve the other problems and that's not honest. That's not honest. For us to do an RNA polymerization, look up the procedure. It's brutally hard. And they have to do things like, um, they have to isolate the, the various uh, isomers of RNA with page. It is just crazy. And the way that they do this, they actually have to take living biotic material to start with so that you get the right chirality. I mean, you know, uh, we could go on and on at the, the chemistry here, and I'm delighted to do it. And there are people more qualified, like Dr. James Carter, Dr. Cy Gart, Dr. Ryan Hayes. Um, if you want to nerd out, we, that's a very good question. So I'm not going to dismiss it. I, I think if you want to be a skeptical person and look at this critical, do critical analysis like a skeptical science scientist, I think that'd be a glorious thing. And I think what I'm pointing out will be vindicated. And thank you very much for the question, Dessel. I don't know what this is referring to. Is this for you? Why five weeks? Did you say something about five weeks? I don't I remember. Don't so, okay, maybe that's not for you. No. Okay, Travis says, is Sal more confident in ID than the resurrection? Yes. Yes. Wow, really? How do you like that for a pity, pithy statement? Cool. My okay. belief in ID made it possible for me to believe in a more difficult miracle, the resurrection. Yeah. No, that's, thank you for, that's a good question. I'm glad you're, I, I try mm -hmm. not to dance around, you know, when people ask me a simple question. So I'm trying, Rebecca, not to get too long-winded here. <laughs> you're doing great. Okay, let's see. I, I'm, um, just trying to look for, um, let's see, is this a question, Dave? Inspired, you believe in faith healing, Rebecca and Sal just said God doesn't show up when you ask. He doesn't always. He doesn't show up on our demand. It's God's will. That's what I think. So I've, mm -hmm. I've had prayers that were answered. I have prayers that didn't get answered the way I wanted. Mm-hmm. 
Rebecca. Me too. Hey, you got, oh, you, yeah, had a, me too. you got a question for you finally. <laughs> oh, this is for me? Oh, did a new yeah. question come up? I'm like way back in the chat because I'm trying to make sure I'm getting to everybody's questions. So, okay. So God of the Gaps is part of Saul's, uh, Saul, Saul's theology? Yes. I mean, I call it God of the Gaps. I don't know what to call it. I believe in miracles. Is that God of the gaps? So I just I just say this. If miracles happen, there has to be a miracle maker. So suspension of the laws of physics, and I showed you the equations of the laws of physics. If I believe that those happen, or the laws of chemistry, I, I'd say that's a miracle. There has to be a reason for it, and I call that a miracle maker. So um, Travis says, can Sal explain the cargo cults using naturalism? They were made up in the 1940s. We agree it's a false religion, right? This isn't hard, Sal. Actually, it's hard for me. I'm not familiar with cargo cults using naturalism. I'm sorry. That's nothing I study. Okay. Um, Thank you for the question, though. I'm sorry I couldn't answer it. Okay, um, bro guy wants to know, is God a test, testable prediction? Yes and no. Um, depend, I mean, you can't put God to the test, he'll take offense. But the Christian God is a testable prediction. If you die and you stand before the judgment seat of God, I'd say that, um, you know, the Christians say this is what will happen. And if you face him on judgment day, uh, uh, that's what we're predicting. And you'll find out if that's confirmed or uh, unverified. Okay. Um, I like this. Midnight Rambler says, why does Sal think other Christian biologists accept evolution and or reject YEC? Oh, this is, this is one of the best questions so far. Not to diss mm -hmm. all the other questions, but I like this one. Because I was a theistic evolutionist and an old earth creationist. I... I can relate. A lot of the physics does superficially, you know, for most of my life, suggest that the universe is old. You know, like the distant starlight problem, radiobatic dating. So you have a lot of old earth creationists. And I cited Fazel Rana's book. He became a Christian because of his study of cell membranes and the question of abiogenesis. But to this day, he's an old earth creationist. So he would reject young earth creationism based on the physics. And maybe alternative, a different interpretation of the Bible. So the question of evolution, the reason evolution is believed by Christians, the variety of reasons. But I would say, do you remember when I was showing those diagrams of the bent pencil? And then I showed like Captain Kirk and the pig and how they were similar. I would say that's why they accept it, because of the, similar, the similarity of forms. Because you start to think when it's like, okay, you have this com this ancestry.com and you can figure out if two people are real how closely related they are you apply that with the dna of the pig and the human and you'll start to see the similarity and then you can build these trees like we're closer in similarity to chimps so this looks like a family tree and it looks like common descent is it looks undeniable. And what I've tried to argue tonight, I said, this is like looking at a pencil in water and saying it's bent. It looks like it, you have to look at it more deeply. And I think fundamentally the answer to this, why do I think other Christian biologists accept evolution? They're not thinking deep enough about the questions I've raised tonight. I think if they study this critically and they realize they don't have answers for this, then I want to push them and say, please don't, represent your belief in evolution to other Christians as science, represent it as a faith statement on your part. I'm not gonna insist yet that you're wrong. I'm gonna insist that you have a faith belief that is not based on empirical science, what I call high quality science, like applied physics, applied chemistry, et cetera. So I'm not gonna be as harsh as some other creationists say that these guys are just wanting to ascend in academia or they're, non, they're actually like not real Christians. Because having been a theistic evolutionist myself and then also wrestling with these questions, it's the problem of similarity of forms in that we do look like we have a family tree when you look at isolated proteins. Isolated proteins, you get this tree. 
But what I tried to show today is when you have a variety of proteins, the picture is more complex. You realize there's no tree for the proteins. And you're like, well, maybe it could just be created from scratch. And that's so in a lot of respects, my presentation tonight was for Christian biologists that accept evolution. Wrestle with what I put on the table tonight, because if you believe Jesus rose from the dead, that he also created water, made water into wine, why is it so hard to believe that he created life from the dust? Thank you. That This is a great question. It's one, yeah, one of my favorite that. questions. Okay. Um, why do you want, this is from Hillary's emails. Why do you want more degrees? How does that make you more employable or credible? I want more degrees because I'm curious to find the truth. One of the outstanding problems in creationism the two of them. The big ones is the distant starlight problem. And the next one is radiometric dating. I want to study photonics to help resolve the distant starlight problem. And it's, it's an exciting possibility. So it may not make me more employable or more credible, but I want to know the truth. Thank you. That's an excellent question. Cool. Um, okay. In music says why is God ask why is asking God to do something to help our unbelief always translated into demand it sounds so negative like okay well we don't have to always if you don't like my choice of words I apologize just put in the word you like and I think it's great to ask God to help our unbelief and there's a case where someone did ask that I, I am, Rebecca and I did a show on Cures for Doubting Thomas, and I'm working on a book just for that. The better way to ask is to ask people, if you really want to believe in Jesus, ask people to pray for you. The reason, and Jesus gave the example of this at the Last Supper. He said, Simon, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. So right there is an example of how people arrive at faith. You can't have it any better than Jesus praying for you. The next best thing is to have people believing Christians pray for you in Jesus name. You can't just force yourself to believe. And that's not real faith anyway, because that's just like self brainwashing. But you can invite people to pray for you. And if, if the apostle Peter's faith was through the answer of prayer, that's how I think everyone's faith ultimately comes. It'll be through an answer of someone's prayer on your behalf. So um, that's a little advertisement for a book that's not yet written, completed, written but hope to be published hey, and rebecca has been on my case huh yeah that would be a great time to plug that book if it was written okay um so paul d says i'm curious has sal ever considered islam yes i thought it was a cool religion i studied a little bit of carlisle and um the Quran has some beautiful passages which i later found out were borrowed from christian hymns or writings but uh, I think David Wood and Sam Shamoon have pretty much persuaded me that um, I'm not going to go there. I'd love to interview. Those would be great, great people for either of us to interview sometime, David Wood or Sam Shamoon. So thank you do for you, the question. Do you have an answer? Do you have a favorite dinosaur? No. Travis wants to know. <laughs> What's, What's your favorite I dinosaur? I kind of like, Travis? okay. I like the ones I saw in the movie Jurassic Park, and I, I, I thought I thought the raptors were pretty cool in Jurassic Park. Cool. Um, just like Emperor Hirohito, did Jesus fall apart after he was executed as a criminal for blasphemy and insult, inciting revolt? I don't think so, because and it's and I covered this on my channel. The reason Christianity spread, you just think about all the religions. Why did Christianity spread? Historically, there are a lot of exorcisms. And it's really funny. I covered this on my channel. There's an NIH archive. They are covering a scientific journal that was doing a book review about the history of miracles. It's really funny. A scientific journal is now in the National Institutes of Health archive. And so the reason... Uh, Jesus, you know, Jesus did not fall apart is when people prayed in his name 
they were exercised. Whereas they are praying in the name of the pagan deities, their life went nowhere. We're seeing that happen even in the present day. I'm glad you asked. People ask, what's my favorite creationist video or whatever or work? It's actually alien intrusion that talks about people that have seen, encountered UFOs that are actually demonic. They pray in the name of Jesus and they get healed. Okay, so if you think I was going to cite some big scientific thing, it's like, no, that is my favorite creationist one. That's why Jesus did not fall apart. His name causes demons to fear and tremble and to be exercised. I don't pray cool. in the name of Hirohito. And yeah, so th thank you for the question. <clears throat> Dre says, don't want to spam you more than I already have. Can you type in the chat that you got my last question? I, I don't, I'm already past, like if you wrote it previously, then I missed it. So um, put it again, please, Drace. And hopefully I'm getting to the bottom. I'm really, there's a lot, I mean, there's been a lot of questions for you, Sal. Well, I hope I hope you're having fun, Rebecca. I am, and I hope I, I am. Hope people in the yeah. chat are, yeah. are you getting tired? No, getting... no. That, that's okay. why you asked you asked your husband to get you a bottle of water. I said we'll just keep going at this. <laughs> hey, 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 and guys, I may have a rehearsal of this talk again tomorrow on my channel. Then I'm driving down to Liberty shortly thereafter. I will be speaking at Liberty University before the Creation Research Society uh, Saturday afternoon. Unfortunately, you have to pay $120 admission, but you got it for free today with even some extras. And then Saturday night, I'm talking about the age of the earth on modern day debate. And Dessel Dracia, yeah, you're more than welcome, sir. It's been, it's been a pleasure. <clears throat> oh, was the question about being God for five weeks? Oh, okay. This was Randolph Richardson. And they said, someone had asked him, and he's an atheist, he's Canadian atheist. He said, what would convince you that God is real? He said, well, if I could be God for just five weeks. And I actually said that <laughs> from a logical standpoint, that makes sense. Because if you're a God, you wouldn't have to prove God existed. And, and there okay. is also, there, there is, if I may just add one thing, um, how can you prove that God doesn't exist? So you, you formally can't. Because to know that God didn't exist, you'd have to have all the facts uh, of all reality available to you, which means you're omniscient. And if you're omniscient, you're probably all powerful. By definition, you'd be God. So it's one of these no-go theorems. That <laughs> if, to have the power to prove what you want, uh, you'd actually have to disprove, disprove it. It's one of those funny theorems. And so that's just a variation. So thank you for explaining that. Now, if Travis wants to know if Christianity was false, could you explain it using naturalism? No demons to blame. I, th I think so. So people have asked what would falsify my belief in, in Christianity. And, and I've gotten flack for this. I'm, uh, this is my view. It's not every other Christian's view. If you could prove that life will spontaneously emerge, I don't think I'd be a Christian today. That's just for me. There are other people that, that wouldn't do it for them, for them. It would for me. So this is, um, that's how I'd explain it using naturalism if Christianity was false. Uh, if you could use naturalism to explain abiogenesis, I don't think I'd have any reason to believe in God. Uh, okay. I, I hope I, I hope that's the question. I answered the question you're asking. Well, I, do, I think he's trying to ask, like, could you explain Christian? Maybe. I don't know. But I'm, I'm thinking he's like meaning, could you explain how Christianity came about from a naturalistic perspective? Maybe like, I don't oh, know. Oh, 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 oh. Like some people say, Sal, you know, don't you realize that these were myths that were made up, et cetera? Um, what I can't explain is, and this is a little bit personal, I met astronaut Charles Duke, youngest man to walk on the moon. When he came back from the moon, he became a Christian. He had a troubled marriage, and God healed that marriage. And some years later, he organized a prayer meeting and prayed for a blind girl. In a few minutes, she was healed. 
and he's a credible witness. He was a national hero in the 70s. I mean, you're the youngest man to walk in the moon. You're a big deal. He's a successful businessman, a general in the Air Force. He had no reason to make that story up. And the way he lives his life today, he goes to the outcasts of society. In his later years, you know, he doesn't have many years to live. He's going to prisons to testify of Jesus. You know, what I find is interesting. If you're a prisoner and, it's, you know, the prison warden says, hey, you know, some guy walked on the moon. He's coming to visit you to tell you about Jesus. I think that'd be really cool. But you see, the way he lived his life has proven to me that Jesus did answer his prayers. And therefore, I believe that's one of the reasons I believe Jesus is real, in addition to the things I've said tonight. So um, going back to, to the way you're interpreting the question, Rebecca, there's some people that will say, don't you see the correlation between the ancient myths and that Christianity was made up? I can't explain then what happened with Charles Duke in, in those terms, because it does seem that the name of Jesus is more powerful than any other name. Um, Broke Guy says, so when people just happen to get better from an illness, is it automa it's automatically God? No. How do you like that for a short answer? <laughs> I like it. Okay. Uh, and do you want me to elaborate, Rebecca? Yeah, because I'm looking for the next question. So elaborate. Yeah, okay. There are some illnesses. I mean, what illness would be bad enough that if you were healed from it, you'd think it was an act of God? That's a rhetorical question. I cite the case of John chapter 9 where the blind man was healed, the blind beggar. And I've actually posed the rhetorical question to atheists. I thought they would say, yeah, they'd follow Jesus the rest of their life. And a lot of them, to my surprise, and I was naive, said no. So if you're a blind beggar out there and your parents have dumped you there to just beg for food, you don't know where your next meal is coming from, you don't know if you're going to be taken care of, what are your prospects in the ancient world if you can't see? And then someone comes into your life, and you know that you've heard that the Messiah is going to arrive at this time. Someone comes into your life, throws mud on your eyes, tells you to wash in the pool, in the pool, and your eyes are open. And then he tells you he's the Messiah. Would you follow him, or would you question? I was surprised a lot of Christian, I mean, a lot of atheists said no, they wouldn't. They'd look for a naturalistic answer, and you know, they gave some of their reasons. It's like, well, why don't, why doesn't Jesus heal everyone? Or I would try to figure a naturalistic answer and heal everyone. It's like, okay, that's what you believe. My response is I would follow Jesus. I had no hope until he came into my life. I would follow him. I'm not going to try to figure out too much or try to intellectualize this or apply philosophy. I would follow Jesus. So kind of extending that, not every self, you know, not every natural healing, like we naturally recover, we, we know that, but there would be some levels of healing that would persuade me that would be one of them. And so that's why that story, the blind girl is especially close to my heart. I think that was a miracle in the name of Jesus. Yeah, and by the way, I'm like really behind. I'm still like, you know, 10 minutes behind on um, these questions so they're not corresponding exactly to like they're not responding to you directly you know because i haven't got that far yet so um answers in atheism says so what we are seeing in phylogeny is not what we are seeing if the earth is young if life is young what you're seeing in phylogeny is circular reasoning because we could not have evolved from a single universal common ancestor as a matter of principle. The patterns of similarity, like I showed with the zebrafish and the humans, are a matter of common design, not common descent. If you assume an old earth, yes, that the phylogeny might be the phylogeny, but if it's a young earth, um, it's definitely common design. Not every creationist would characterize it that way, but I'd say that's the most forceful way to state it. You can't disprove the phylogeny just by looking at the phylogeny. You have to appeal to some external factors, like such as the age of the earth. So um, that, phy that supposed phylogeny then is just like the car phylogeny. It's not common descent, it's common, design, common design, just like I described 
with the cars. They're independently created things that are variations on the design. And the purpose of that design is the subject of my work on steganography and, and the K-Modes algorithm. And uh, what was the other one? Uh, there's another, oh, direct coupling analysis. Google direct coupling analysis. God has created those variations among sequences to enable protein fold prediction and to facilitate the scientific method. That's the reason for the patterns of similarity and diversity to optimize the scientific method. It's not to deceive us. Nice. Okay, Does this is also from Travis. Does Sal think oh, um, old earth creationists aren't true Christians? No, I think they're true. They can be true Christians. I was an old earth creationist. And I think during that time, I was a Christian. I was just mistaken. Thank you for the question. <clears throat> and since we're on that topic, I love, Sal has like a chart made up of like all the different topics related to evolution, young earth creation, and like like physics, biology, this, this, this. this. And so he kind of charted out his progress. Oh, yeah. I love that. If you want to pull it up, you can. But basically, Sal, it took him years to actually come to believe the way he yeah. believes now. And he kind of like has like a chart that shows where he was over the years. And that's on my that. that's on my com that's on another computer. I'm sorry. Okay, I can't we'll do it another it day. Up. That's fine. But if I may point out the chart has changed over time because we've had new, ex we've had more and more experiments, new discoveries, things that I thought then were overturned by scientific, scientific discoveries. Thank you. Travis is just on fire with his questions tonight. Can, can Sal define special pleading? No, I don't think I can. Uh, but I would okay. suggest I would suggest abiogenesis and evolutionary theory are built on special pleadings. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so does Sal believe the earth is flat since it is biblical? Uh, your your premise that it flat earth is biblical, I, I, I reject. Um, there are passages in the Bible that talk about the circuit of the earth. And um, so I have to reject that. I don't believe the earth is flat. I believe it is a spheroid, which is close to a, a sphere. It's, I think it's ellipsoid. I'm sorry, ellipsoid. That's a formal term when I was in the aviation field. They said, no, 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 it's not a sphere. It's an ellipsoid or something like that. I've, I've since forgotten the term. Thank you for the question. <laughs> um, Sandal says, I'm kind of afraid of Jesus. I, this is not a question. I just wanted you to respond to that. That's a good thing. If you look at the New Testament, Jesus was feared. In the book of Revelation, people will ask the mountains to fall on them because they fear the wrath of the Lamb, who is Jesus. And you look at the passages, like when people were irreverent, like the sons of Siva, um, and, and people suffered consequences, people, fear fell upon them in the name of Jesus, who's revered. So that's why we are commanded not to use the name of the Lord in vain. Um, bad things can happen. Um, Travis says, who is Sal debating the age of the earth with? My tag team partner is someone named Christopher, and I've not met him. The opponents are T-Jump and PhD Tony. Oh, wow. How fun. I can't wait to see this. Okay, um, gorgeous. And by the way, this is not my field of expertise. So this is, you're going to see me debating a topic I'm not that comfortable with. But I'm going to be talking, oh, since you brought it up, I'm going to be throwing out, it's my chance to advertise my research on heavy electron quasi particles and photonuclear processes and uh, quantum attraction. So this is going to be fun. I'm going to go from angles people are not expecting. Cool. Um, oh, thank gorgeous you. Running Chrome is just saying thanks, and um, and music is saying thanks for answering my questions. You were both awesome tonight. Oh, what a kind thing to say. God bless you. 
Can I say God bless you to all? God bless you all for, for coming. It's been fun. Yeah, and I'm still going through to make sure I'm not missing any comments here. Um, <clears throat> Answers in Atheism says, so theistic evolution acceptors are fools for believing in God? I was a, no, no. Um, I was a theistic evolutionist for a while. And, and theistic evolutionists, I've asked them, I said, do you believe in miracles or answered prayer? Some of them will say yes. Uh, also the archaeology would suggest it. And then Francis Collins, he cites the, I think he, he cites the fine tuning argument as favor and evidence of, of God. He cites altruism, which can't be evolved by group selection or natural selection as evidence of God. So I would not say that they're fools for believing in God. They have their reasons. Oh, Francis Collins. I need to say he's a theistic evolutionist. He was an agnostic or he, he came from a non-believing family. He was, uh, he was an MD and a PhD in quantum mechanics, physics, really chemistry. And mm -hmm. um, during his residency, because he's also an MD, medical doctor, he was treating a cancer patient and he said he saw something in her that he couldn't explain. All his science couldn't explain. He said, she is dying with such a peace in her heart. And he said that that had to come from a source greater than anything he'd studied. And that's the one thing all the science could not cure is the human condition and give you answer for give you an answer to as to why you should live and even endure in the face of death and rejoice. And he said, I want that in my life. So even though he's a theistic evolutionist, he's not a fool. I think he found the good thing. And he was wise for perceiving that and realizing there are no answers in atheism. There is an answer in Jesus. Thank you. I think he's saying that because you said you wouldn't believe in God if a biogenesis could happen. That, that would break it for me. And I said, that's for me, maybe not for other people. Yeah. yeah. Um. Brokai says he would like some evidence of the story of the blind girl. Was the girl confirmed blind beforehand and confirmed seeing afterwards? I only Where have... can people find that story? Look up Moonwalker. The book, I'm going to give you book? actually a page number. Yes, look it up on Amazon. Moonwalker by Charles Duke, and I'm going to give you the page number. So yes, I, no, I think if I, if I can say this, I think wanting more evidence is a great thing. It's a noble thing. And, and, and um, if your interest has been sparked and you don't get as much evidence as you want, I, I respect that. And, and I think you're entitled, you should be skeptical. So let me look up the page reference. Um, <clears throat> page 271 through 273 in his book Moonwalker by Charles Duke. And he says, I've seen miracles of healing, miracles of deliverance as demons fled in the name of Jesus. Oh, but to your point, uh, I've heard about Craig Keener. And I would encourage you, I'll tell you one thing, is if you hang out in churches, you start to meet a lot of people. There are a lot of charlatans and hypocrites, sadly. But every now and then you're going to meet someone who looks so sincere and you'll say, what happened to you? He said, I, I was healed or I saw a miracle. Yeah. And it's the way they live their lives that tells you that they're sincere, okay? especially if they're like humble people and they're not like trying to draw attention to themselves to kind of get more donations for their ministry. It'd be people like mm -hmm. that. And if I may just pause a little bit. Mm -hmm. We have prayed, Rebecca and I have prayed for some people out there. And I prayed for like Danish debater and said, you know, would a miracle help you believe? He said, yes. And I said, I'll pray God will grant you a miracle. So maybe the one thing regarding your question is, would it help you to believe 
if Jesus granted a miracle in your life. If you want that, we can pray for you for that. Would you like us to pray for you? Just, I, I mean, now that you brought it up, maybe that'll be more convincing than digging yeah. up the evidence. Just, well, just let me keep going it. with the questions sure. and then we'll pray at right. the end. Okay, yeah. so Brogai says, even a common flu virus can be deadly, but people get better from those all the time. Is every time someone gets better from the flu a work of God? No. I mean, it's not a miraculous work of God. Yeah. It, is, it would be God using natural means. And I define natural by, like you saw, I gave all the equations there. Mm-hmm. Um, what if Satan was dressed like Jesus? How could you know? Oh, that is a good question. So let me see. I'm going to have to look up the Bible verse here. Uh, no, th this is, this is relevant because some people have seen an apparition and they thought it was Jesus and it wasn't. Second Corinthians 11, second Corinthians 11. Verse 14, but let me just look it up. I want to I want to respect the question here. Um, I'm just going to read it in context, starting at verse 12. And what am I doing? I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. And there is somewhere else in the New Testament where it says the test is, do you confess? You, you talk to the apparition and say, do you confess Jesus came in the flesh? And the experience of missionaries is if they encounter a demonic entity, they will refuse to answer that. They cannot confess Jesus came in the flesh. So you can test the spirits. So let's see if I could find that passage. Uh, and uh, first Stephanie John four, one through six, first John, uh, Test the spirits, and that's how you would do it. So thank you. Cool. Stephanie's here, and she wrote uh, that she actually wrote to Kenneth Hagen at a letter asking for documentation of someone ever getting healed of type 1 diabetes. No answer. Um, yeah. And that, that may mean, have. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some sketchy stuff going on there. However, I think some people do get healed, even if you have a charlatan evangelist. Um, that's why I, I have been really thinking, you know, pray for people. Uh, I could pray for, I mean, if you really are sincere and not just a scoffer. And I'm sorry to say this, but I think some of the questions here are just kind of scoffing and they're not taking this seriously. And, you know, well, uh, Stephanie's I, yeah. a believer in God. Okay. Are you responding to Stephanie? She's a believer in no, God. No, 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 I wasn't. Oh, are you, you know, responding to Paul? I'm sorry. I was like looking at the chat, so I got distracted. I was, I'm not going to name names. Okay. Okay. Um, are you responding to this, though? What if Jesus was some sort of shadowy supernatural demon who led people away from Judaism? And, and that, that has been a claim. Let me just throw this out there. Uh, then you're toast, if that's the case, <laughs> and you follow Jesus. You know, we all make decisions, like, say, signing up for contracts, deciding who we marry. We make decisions on incomplete information, and we take risks. We take risks for what we love. And I follow Jesus because I love him. I can't imagine a universe without him. Can I prove that he is who he says he is? I can't absolutely, but I would take a risk because I ultimately I love him and I want to follow him and I can't imagine the universe without him. And that's about all where I'll leave it. You know, we're all like little children. We can't prove that our parents are going to take care of us when we're little children. And the sad thing is a lot of some, there are a few parents that don't, but what choices do you, what alternatives do you have? 
And that's what I would post to people. It's like, you know, you can come up with these objections and I'd say they're reasonable. My response though is, do you have any better alternatives? For me, there is no answers in atheism. And I said, I'd rather cast my lot for Jesus. I don't see any other religion being as strong as the name of Jesus to cast out demons. So that's the best I can give to you. Thank you for your question. Sandals says, does Sal believe in human devolution from the Old Testament times? Yes. And I'm going to show you a graph. And I, I have two lines of evidence. This is from Dr. Sanford's book. And this graph shows the decline of the ages of the patriarchs. So Adam, Adam and Methuselah lived longer. And with each generation, our lifespans we're getting shorter. Now you're like, well, this is a creationist book. Well, first of all, Dr. Sanford is a very successful secular scientist. He's an atheist, became Christian. And I have this book. And genetics Adam is his specialty. So yeah. Genetics is a specialty. And you saw the shape of that graph. I want to show you a graph from a book by geneticist uh, Brian Sykes. He wrote Adam's Curse here. Yeah, that's the book cover, sorry. <laughs> I tried to get one that's more modest, but that's just the way it is. And you could see that declining exponential curve. Now that's not the same time frame. So yes, we have decayed genetically. We have some evidence that we have because uh, our IQs seem to be declining and that's also a testable hypothesis. So of the number of birth defects, if we look at um, the anthropological fossil record of say a few thousand years, uh, our bones are stronger, our cranial capacity was stronger, therefore we probably were more intelligent. And just looking at the ancient world, it did look like we had more mental capacity. So I'd also suggest that extends also to the longness of life. But I need to point one other thing out. I'm sorry to be long-winded, but I love throwing out a fact. There is a condition called progeria, which is premature aging. Uh, the, the poor kids die at age 13. Only one gene causes him to have six times shorter lifespan. That's the lamin A gene. So it's very easy to imagine that we are in a much better state and even just a few mutational changes could have started to compromise us from living close to a thousand years down to the age, you know, um, the age limit we have now. So uh, that's a long answer to your question, but I wanted to throw some facts to reinforce that. So thank you. That's one of my favorite questions. Thank you. Cool. Um, the U News Unit Underground says, is this a Christian channel? Yes, this is a Christian channel, <laughs> but it does have um, quite a lot of atheists on it. Okay, so um, uh, let's see. I mean, I'm a Christian, Sal's a Christian, uh, but most of the people in the chat probably aren't. So he says, are there any Bible believers uh, oh. here? I'm a Hi, Bible News believer. Oh, by the way, yes. And greetings to News Unit Underground. He used to live near here. He's an air traffic controller. <laughs> I don't know that I had the privilege of him directing me when I was flying around in the, uh, in, um, around uh, IAD, the Dulles airspace. But anyway, uh, we'll meet here, there, and in, in the air, brother. God bless you. So um, Sandal says, okay, isn't that some sort of evolution? Yes, it's, uh, it's descent with modification, but in the wrong way not toward complexity. So Jar Darwin's uh, book, Origin of Species, his famous book, chapter six, is the um, um, organs of extreme perfection and complication. The idea was evolution would build more complexity. We're finding that the dominant mode of descent with modification is loss of function. So yes, it is. It is actually real evolution. Real evolution is set with modification and the modifications are toward loss of function, loss of versatility. That's a testable prediction by observation and experiment. Yep. Thank you. And actually Michael B. He wrote a book on it. Darwin devolves. So he's talking about how evolution <laughs> works in the wrong direction. Right. Right. So it's, it's Re Rebecca, I'm impressed. You have all these books, you know, <laughs> you just pull them out there. It's like, Oh yes. You know, like I said, Marco Severling, he said, I got that one. And I said, Sigard, you got that one. And, you know, from from matter to life or something. And it's just like, wow, 
<laughs> you're just yeah i mean people think i know nothing about this uh evolution abiogenesis and i even though i've read so many books on this topic sal but the thing is i have a superpower it's forgetting everything i read after i read it like after a week i don't remember any of it so um i've been around these arguments and this stuff for quite a long time and <clears throat> I've read uh, read quite a quite a few books on the topic, but I just don't. The technical stuff doesn't stick in my brain. So it doesn't stick in mine either. That's why I have to have so many nerd torture sessions till it starts to sink in. <clears throat> now here's an interesting question, and I want to I want to chime in on this too. Um, and is this Paul? Do you pronounce your name Paul or is it Pavel? Um, anyway, why would ch church attract so few good people? But I'm just going to let you answer that, Paul. I mean, Sal. Because we're all sinners and there's no one good, no, not one. That is a Bible verse. And um, it's good that churches attract people that are in need of a savior and need of forgiveness. Yep. Good answer. I'm Girl sorry. Friend, that's the best I could do. And now we're, well, and I agree. And I actually think it's more likely for um, like, you know, people who realize their sinfulness, it's easier for us to come to know the Lord because he's so attractive to us, you know? And so, and then, you know, people aren't usually instantly transformed in every way. So they can still keep, you know, some of their struggles and difficulties for a long time. And so it's no surprise to me that, it, you know, the church is full of people that have sin issues. Uh, so, yeah. I, I got an anecdote about that. It's kind okay. of funny and beautiful. Um there's a famous creationist scientist in our circles, in the creationist circles, named Richard Lumsden. And um, his wife, called, his ex-wife called him and said, you know, our, our daughter is having some problems. And he's thinking, oh, she, you know, she's in something big trouble. Found out she became a Christian. He didn't know what to do. He thought it was something really bad. And the daughter was praying for him. And he eventually became a Christian. But... Prior to that, the daughter said, why don't you come to church, Daddy, with me? I think you should come to church with me. He said, oh, oh darling, you know, I, I can't do that. You know, besides, I'm a hypocrite. I feel kind of bad going to church. And the daughter responded, oh, no, Dad, there are lots of hypocrites in church. You'll feel just, you'll fit <laughs> just right in. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, but that's not to say that Jesus d doesn't change people. He does. And I've seen his power change other people. I've seen his power change me. And so he does change people. So it's, and, and sometimes he radically changes people. Uh, other times there's, you know, some radical changes, but then some other, you know, sinful behaviors that hang on for quite a long time. So, um, but bro guy responded to your, you know, offer to pray. And he said, I've already had 23 years people praying over me for a miracle when I was a Christian, yet I still ended up as an atheist after honest questioning. I have no need for prayer. Wow. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for, yeah. thank you for being straight up. All right. Thank yeah. You. And thanks for sharing your experience. Yeah. Th th thanks for just, you know, I, I appreciate just, you know, people telling it like it is. Yeah. And I, you know, I think Rebecca and I have kind of, we try not to be too judgmental, uh, meaning, you know, we try not to say you're just, you know, saying negative things about you, right? Just, you know, that, that's between you and God. You know, we're, we're here to just, you know, if we could be of service to you, that's what I want to do. So th thank you. Yeah. And so I was I'm about to offer prayer for you and he said he doesn't. He says, I have no need for prayer. So if I'm not mistaken, it was because Rebecca and I were about to offer prayer for you. But if you have no need, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll respect that, sir. Uh, thank you. 
Yeah. Okay. So um, Rebel Nazarene says, is the Atheist of the Month Award a nice way of saying most illogical of the month? Well, that's, that, that's you, Rebecca. <laughs> am I most illogical? No, I don't want to answer that question. <laughs> what's your, what's your criteria for Atheist of the Month? No. Um, <clears throat> well, actually, it's just participating. Like the there you name go. I see the most in the chat, the, the, the people who are like consistently here and like that's I'm just that's how I'm doing it. I'm not even paying attention to if you're nice, if you're mean, like <laughs> you could be. <laughs> so, there you go. You know, See, now you know the metric. So it's not illogical. It's whether you just show up. Yeah. Um, and I, I still remember there was someone who was really tickled. He got atheist a month. It was Titan Uranus. Um, <laughs> yes. He was bragging all over the internet. Hey, guess who's atheist of the month? <laughs> Now, bro guy says, I think Rebecca's superpower is why she's still a Christian. She forgets anything informative that contradicts her deeply rooted beliefs. <laughs> well, you know what? I'm like surrounded by you guys just pumping all this stuff at me all the time. So uh, I, I feel like I've. Uh, and you see, this is your, I have to agree with that because. Is. I'm sorry. I said I've oh, absorbed their ideas. I mean, I've I've taken them in. I I remember them. Well, we'll see the way you're you're happy now. It's the way you are when they're assaulting and criticizing your belief. You're just you just you just brush it off. You you, you always have fun. Yeah. Uh, the news unit says, "Can someone come and show me some love?" I want to. Yeah, hey, I love the air love traffic controllers. Jesus. And how do you become a Christian? Sal, do you want to answer that? I thought News Unit Underground, I thought you you were a Christian. I mean, you were reading the King James Bible. Well, why don't you just explain simply, Sal, how to become a Christian? If you believe Jesus rose from the dead and accept him as Lord and Savior, that is how you become a Christian. The question is then how can you believe that? Jesus rose from the dead. For me, there are three lines of evidence, personal testimony of what Jesus has done in people's lives, like Charles do. Um, for me, the creation evolution controversy weighs heavily into that. And then um, the archeological record. And I think, again, faith comes, it says, that faith comes from hearing, but that's that's a necessary, but not necessarily sufficient condition. That's the way I interpret that verse. I really think that it's people praying for you, that God would give you the saving faith. So that's about, you know, there's not really a how to, but there are some steps you can do to help yourself. So it's great to see you if I think you are the person I think you are, the air, former air traffic controller. So God bless you. Um, Aaron says, be careful, Rebecca, you might be enticing believers to deconstruct with that atheist of the month award. Yeah. Well, if any, anybody who does not identify as an atheist and you're in my chat a lot and, and on my channel, then I'd be happy to give you an award. You don't have to become an atheist to get the award. Okay. I'll, I can do more than one award. So, um, and Stephanie is offering some encouragement to News Unit, who was kind of saying he doesn't feel like anyone cares about his soul. So she said, you should care for your own soul. You got one. We all do. We're eternal, all connected. Thank you, Stephanie, for encouraging him. Yes, yeah, nice to see you. I, I think we've run into each other before. Yeah, yeah thanks for encouraging him. And um, so Bro Guy says, I really appreciate Rebecca for holding these streams and Sal for answering all of these questions. It's a good time to be had. And um, thank you. News Unit says, Do you have to repent 
do I have to repent to become a Christian? Oh boy, we're getting into tough theological. <laughs> I think if you believe you're supposed to repent, that's the fruit. Um, I'm I'm not a theologian. I'd rather just quote the Bible. So I, you know. Yeah, you know, news unit. I just want to encourage you. If you're desiring to be saved by Jesus Christ, I think you can trust that you are safe with Him. He knows your desire. He knows that you're, um, a, you know, that you want to be saved, and he, he's he's not looking for a formula. So he's he's eager to save. So um, answers in atheism says I'm going to roast you, Rebecca, if I don't get an award. Well, Mike, you're not here enough. I have to tell you, you're rarely here for for a live stream, but um. You know, you I need to stop you. making so many streams yourself and then show up on Rebecca's channel. That's how you can become <laughs> atheist of the month. How about that? Yeah, but, <laughs> but 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 you roast me anyway. You roast me anyway, don't you? I, I there's all these autopsies and things on your channel, which I love, by the way. So don't stop. You're welcome to 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 do that as much as you want. Uh, so. Okay, I think that's a good place to stop, Sal. Did you have yeah. a final thought you wanted to share about repentance? Is that that's what a good question. At? And, and you know, there's really a lot about Christian doctrine and theology that I, I need to keep studying. So uh, thank you for the question. And I am a little embarrassed that I couldn't respond to such a basic question. I know there, there are lots of, I, 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 I am familiar about the debate whether you have to repent or whether belief is just enough. And, I, you know, I don't get into that. I think if you believe and you truly believe, you're going to repent. So I think um, it would be a sufficient but not necessary condition. I don't know. So just put that in the I don't know category. You know, I'm not. You know, I, I think if you if you believe Jesus rose from the dead and he's your Lord and Savior and you you obey his commands, um, that's sufficient. Whether it's necessary, that's where I think all the theological things get into. And I'm just like, well, you know, why don't I why don't I get as much of the checklist filled out as I can, and then I'm not going to worry about whether uh, one thing that I whether I can sacrifice one on the checklist. That's about, it's, that's about the best answer I could give. You know, um, we can think about these theological questions, but I think at the end of the day, how do we live our lives? That's the real, that's the real thing. And if you live in love and fear of the Lord, you're gonna try to do everything. So if he said to repent and to do these other things, try to do them. And one thing I do like about the Catholics is they want to attend to the poor and I need to do more of that and care for, you know, things like that because there's parables. So do I have any wrapping um, uh, thoughts in this wrap up? Um, I had a lot of fun I, and, you know, I can't summarize how much fun I've had because I've been looking forward to this opportunity to be on your channel. It's been very Gracious of you to invite me, and um, I you think mean for you to invite yourself? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I invited myself, <laughs> which I love. And and you know, anybody who's watching, if you want to come on my channel, invite yourself. I'm happy to have. <laughs> there you go. People on. Um, but uh, look, let's put this question up because he's put it up several times and he thinks I'm ignoring him. Jake wants to know, how did the blind man blind from birth find the pool on his own if he was still blind until he washes? Well, blind people are able to do, you know, to navigate. I see them and it's kind of sad, but they find a way to, to navigate. I see them walking with their stick. Yeah, I think Jake that's making a huge assumption about, you know, the blind person if he's 
been blind, then he's learned how to get around perfectly. And I, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, I promised Rebecca I'm not going to be too confrontational. But uh, do you apply the same level of skepticism to your beliefs about origins or anything else? And do you think you can find it? I, I don't know if you're an atheist or not, but if you are, you know, how do you decide what's uh, what's true and what's right and wrong and how do you find values? So I'd encourage you to apply the same level of skepticism uh, that you're applying to these questions. So there's that one confrontational moment. I promise Rebecca, I try to be a good boy today. So um, as, well, this has been great, Sal. Thank you so much. And great. thank you to the thank chat, you. everybody who's been here. Great questions. Loved answering your questions. And um, we'll see you guys soon. Oh, and on Thursday, I'm really excited. I met a, I'm, I'm having a lady on. She's a Christian Buddhist. Answers in atheism. Are you listening? Christian Buddhist is coming on my channel on Thursday evening. And I met her at a furniture store. And now she's coming on my channel. I'm so excited. So um, I, I look forward to hearing her perspective and I hope you'll be here. Good night, everybody. And watch Sal's debate on Saturday, right? Modern day right. debate. Yep. Modern okay. day debate. Okay. Take care. God and bless everyone. God bless everyone. And if you want to hear more from Sal, you can go to his channel, Evidence and Reasons. And he's got lots of nerd torture sessions. If you really want to go deep in the weeds on the scientific stuff, you know, you can get plenty more of that. Good night.